The vile bloods are fiendish creatures who threaten the purity of the church's blood healing. Master Lagarius led his executioners into Canehurst Castle to cleanse it of the vile bloods. But all did not go well, and Master Lagarius became a blessed anchor guarding us from evil. Tragic, tragic times that Master Lagarius should be abandoned in the accursed domain of the vile bloods. I must free him so that he may be properly honored in martyrdom. Hello everyone, this is Aegon of Astora, and welcome back to Bloodborne Let's Talk Lore. This is episode number 25, being recorded on Monday the 21st of March. I hope you're all having a fantastic day today, whenever it is you find yourself watching this. How about you, JSF? Are you having a good day today? I am having a very good day today, Aegon. Well, it's very happy to hear that. JSF has kindly agreed to join us once again. Uh, Thank to... you for asking me. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, JSF is here to bring his expertise on Castle Canehurst to bear mm -hmm. on uh, our visit to Castle Canehurst. And though uh, there's a fair bit of farting around that takes place before we actually enter Castle Canehurst, uh, I would encourage you to go and check out his video on Castle Canehurst from his Bloodborne Up Close series, uh, because we'll be covering a lot of the, the topics that JSF brings up in that video. And I'll be able to correct the mistakes I made in that one in this one. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let's save you the trouble of, of making an, an addendum video for that one. I'll be doing an addendum anyway. <laughs> and we'll, we'll also be talking a little bit uh, where the present topic intersects with uh, JSF's most recent video uh, and I think his, his best work on oh, Ud. Thank you. Uh, who, yeah, I, I'm sure you can speak to just how impossible it is to even grab hold of something to talk about when it comes to it and especially for a series like yours where like uh, yeah you're much more uh, about environmental detail yeah yeah and so this this crazy sprinting executioner notwithstanding yeah. uh something we discussed brightest. before uh we started recording here was how uh right after i kill this guy we look at the skyline and so I was looking at the skyline at the time of recording, thinking that it was Canehurst. I'm thinking that it it's looked Yarnum. rather odd, but yeah, you, you were saying that that's actually Yarnum. That's Yarnum, because Canehurst is, is like way, way further to the left. Yeah. That That's Yarnum, but it looks like an earlier build of Yarnum. Yeah, because the, the clock tower looks different. The clock tower is massive, and like you can see that looks like the bridge where we fight the cleric beast. Hmm. Where, or at where least, the, like, the... yeah. And, and this, uh, I believe I was looking at, just, just to point out that it looks like similar script to that which we find throughout the rest of the game. Yeah, yeah. I actually found the, um, and I'm, I'm stupefyingly don't have it with me, but it was the, the real world um, uh, inspiration behind Hamwick. Oh, okay. Interesting. I found a, a village in, I think, Romania that looks exactly like this, complete with the, the like, random uh, gravestones just sort of sticking out of the ground everywhere. So are you going to make just a giant addendum video for all of these these additions? They, or? Yeah, yeah. I sent it to Redgrave. He he agreed it looked the same. So Interesting, because, yeah, cause it's... And that's part of the problem with trying to fully capture. So mm. so what? It, well, so yeah. that's Yarnum there, then? That looks like... Yeah, that's that's definitely... Well, it's not Canehurst, and Yarnum is in that direction, so it's probably Yarnum. Okay. Because, yeah, because the, well, yeah, the skyboxes... Like, boxes, something we've talked about is, is the... Um, the way that the clock tower is incredibly prevalent in early work and it, it in early uh, footage of the game and trailers and stuff, and then as you get closer to release, the clock tower becomes less and less and less of a thing. And it looks like that's an even earlier version where the clock tower just completely dominated everything. Hmm. Well, and hmm. and yeah, the, the the newer or I guess the the final iteration of the clock tower it seems to like it, it looms lower over the landscape yeah. or over the the, the cityscape. And this yeah. here, I was just... What is that called again? An obelisk. Obelisk. 
and what is that? Is is it's just like well, a monument? And, uh, well, obelisk just means a a uh, stone standing stone. Okay. But that particular kind of obelisk. Oh. Anyway, uh, so obelisk. yeah, I accidentally walked into the obelisk there, but yeah. go on. Um, obelisk just means any kind of like standing stone, but that particular kind of obelisk is um, it's basically like a, a you put it at crossroads to show you where each road leads. And so, so would that have been somehow a a crossroads between? Well, you it's know- called Hemwick Crossing. If you look at the um. Hmm. The, the Kanehurst the, the summons. summons it says will meet you at, at Hemwick Crossing. So this would have this is apparently a crossroads, except it clearly isn't because it only goes in one direction, really. Yeah. Unless you consider the the path off to the witch's abode to be part of it. And what is so? So these horses are they're clearly dead. Yeah, and and clearly not actually. Um, so something that I trigger accidentally here in a couple of minutes. Is the it's it's I guess death animation, yeah, which is strikingly similar to that which we find when we attack, say, Garman in the Hunter's or Dream, Mikolash, yeah, or Mikolash when when he's uh, like running away from you, mm. and so yeah, and and I think that that blood was actually from one of the dogs. I should have checked on that. Yeah, after yeah, you the can fact. see the stain kind of on the ground. Yeah, yeah, but it's just it's so strange. How this carriage just shows up out of nowhere. And yeah, well, I think I think a lot of the strangeness around Kanehurst can be explained by this wasn't initially how it was supposed to be. Okay. If that makes sense. Because like, if so, you, sorry, as, as you mentioned, the, the Kanehurst yeah, yeah. summons uh, yeah. states that it's an old bloodstained summons inviting an honored guest to the Forsaken Castle Kanehurst. Rather bafflingly, it is addressed to you. Do not hesitate. The stagecoach leaves from Hemwick Crossing. Yeah. So sorry, go so on. So this would have been a crossroads with the obelisk showing you where the different roads went. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it's like a road sign. And and yeah, so we have the sigil there, and it's it's covered in yeah. what, what appears to be cobwebs. Uh, uh, yeah, and again, it, it's in a much better state than we find it later on. Yeah, which which, uh, but and that's that's one thing I've been I was thinking about while recording this is whether or not that is even supposed to be the same stagecoach. Well, we we step out of it, so presumably it is. But when we step out of it, it's upright, right? And then, yeah. So, but like, what in happens it. in between? You know, that happening and then uh, the the gameplay kicking back in, and then it's kind of keeled over and it's got snow on yeah. it, and it appears like it's been there yeah. for a very long time. So yeah, but like, I really get the impression that like this area was designed totally differently to the way it shows up in the final game. In what respect? Um. Well, pretty much all of it. Like, um, we'll see when we get to Kanehurst, but the bridge mm-hmm. that connects Kanehurst to Witch's abode is moved. Mm. Um, it moves between Kenwick and Kanehurst. And also you can see Witch's abode is massive. Mm-hmm. It's tiny inside when we actually go in there. Mm-hmm. And, like, it also looks like the Witch's boss room was, um, was recycled from an earlier build of the game, but I'll get to that later on. So, like I said, there's a fair bit of farting around before we actually get to Kanehurst, but that's what we do on this show, so... (sighs) 
Lawrence, Master Willem, somebody help. And so you can if see it's it's kind of similar. Beating up old women now you're bashing a guy in a wheelchair. Well, it's it's in the interest of the lore. <laughs> it's for the lore, I promise. Okay, well, we'll talk about this now. You can see, right, this past, this some, um, which is abode, right, we just basically saw all of it. Mm -hmm. But you look at it from the outside, it's huge. It's absolutely massive. And if you look at the room you fight the Witch of Hemwick in, there's actually a bunch of iconography that looks like it's part of the healing church. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, and I, also, I, I was looking at that yeah. right at the beginning of the episode. Yeah. Because yeah, that's something like, I never sculpture. noticed there. Yeah, and... Like, this is going into, like, complete... It's not quite speculation, but it basically is. In the very, very early trailers, you can see the hunter is fighting Vicar Amelia in that room. Oh, interesting. And I have no idea if you were intended to fight Amelia there, or if um, they just thought, well, we have to shove this boss somewhere, we'll put it here for the yeah, sake the of having a trailer. Yeah, the Grand Cathedral's not ready, yeah, so we'll just put them yeah, there. Yeah, but, okay. but like, in, in that same one, you see, like, Ibriatus in the Grand Cathedral. So I have no idea whether this was intended or whether it... Showed up later on. Because yeah, the can, exterior yeah. appearance suggests a much larger interior. Yeah, but the other thing is that you get in there just by going down a really narrow flight of stairs with, like, bricks either side of it, which feels like they copy-pasted that room from somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because you see that a lot in Dark Souls 2, which has, like, a notoriously sort of difficult development where they kept changing where things were. Mm -hmm. So and you see, there's a lot of places in that where you just, like, there's just a cave nowhere with a flight of stairs that leads down to a different area because it's just like and then you're in a completely how do we connect these yeah. two places oh well we can't draw a new map so we'll just shove some stairs there But yeah, you Doesn't can see that mind, this though, one is a little bit more... It's more yeah. like a mist, and the other one is more like a Cosmos-esque effect. And also, it, it doesn't have, like, a being hit animation. So yeah, if you, if you hit Garamond, he actually flinches. You can hear him going, ugh. But with the, the, the carriage itself, it just kind it of... It just vanishes. And also, like, it should be noted as well that, you know, after hitting it, there's I didn't do anything else. I just went back and it was there again. Yeah. Which is, again, like, that's, that suggests, like, something was cut. Like, I, I think the initial idea was that that witch's abode would be much larger, and at the end of it, you would find the carriage which would take you across the bridge to Canehurst. But they never finished it. Because, we'll, I mean, we'll see when we get there, but Canehurst is connected via the bridge to the back of witch's abode. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, the... The uh, horse and carriage just goes across. Like, there's a bridge that's not... It's, like, crumbled. It's not there anymore. The place where we get the, the lake rune, right? Yeah, where you find the lake rune. Um, yeah, so it looks like... That there, there would have been an so like sim a last similar to thing? how, you know, we were supposed to reach Firelink Shrine in Dark Souls 1. In that there was an actual, kill. like, path you would walk, and then it, it became, yeah, the, like, yeah. you would have to drop into that hole. Yeah, it feels like something like that has happened, and this is, um, like, they, it feels like they didn't finish whatever was going to happen in the Witch of Hemwick's room. Hmm, interesting. Because the whole of Kanehurst is just, like, cut content everywhere, basically. Yeah, it's yeah, an extremely especially with, finished area. as we'll talk about, uh, Queen Annalise in particular. Especially, yeah, Annalise is just... Complete, almost completely unfinished, and, and something that I didn't get a chance to do in this episode, because we've not yet been to, uh, Tumaru, uh, Eye Hill is the deal with the whole ring of betrothal thing. So maybe I'll save yeah. that for when we when you myself and Red Ra Redgrave go to uh Murgo's loft. Murgo's loft. And we'll talk about it then. But uh yeah. But yeah, it's uh, I I don't know what to make of all this stuff, but I just when I was recording, I was just like I want to test some stuff out. So yeah. Animal cruelty be damned. Animal cruelty. <laughs> and elder cruelty. Uh
So when we when we actually arrive there, we find that yeah, it's it's covered in frost, and you know the the horses are themselves they look like they froze to death. Yeah. So I don't know. I was thinking that maybe this could be a different carriage, suggesting that we're not the first ones to have yeah. been granted an invitation. And I guess but not the thing the is, last, we get out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also in the interest of trying new things. Anyway, that, that's, that was a glitch in early versions of the game, where if you died, um... If you died here, it would respawn you at Hamwick without the horses and you could never get back to Kanehurst. Oh, that I was not aware of. Very interesting. Uh, I actually, during my blind playthrough, I actually stunned... And so that is Yarnum, then. Once again, you that's can see the Yarnum. clock tower. Um, and that is Hemwick? No, no, that's just, a, that's just some rocks. Oh, no, well, to, to the left there. Um, no, Hamwick is facing, like, the, the bridge makes a perfect straight line to Hamwick. Oh, okay, so so it's obscured by whatever's on the other side it's, of this yeah, bridge Yeah, you here. can okay. kind of see it. But yeah, the bridge changes position. And, um, it's sort of hard to tell unless you specifically look for it, which I don't know if you did. But the, the bridge that we get to, like, we get on the horse and carriage, the horse and carriage rides off over a bridge that's been destroyed. But that bridge does not connect, like, in a linear fashion to Hamwick. It's actually a different bridge that connects to Hamwick. Mm -hmm. And the bridge that connects to Hamwick comes out the back of Witch's abode. So it looks like you were supposed to... So you would have had to have done, like, a 90-degree turn at some point, right? To... Yeah, I mean, unless unless the road, uh, the broken road, is, like, going... has turns in it. It looks like what was meant to happen is you were meant to get the carriage from the back of Witch's abode. Hmm. Because Which... otherwise the geography doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, yeah. But that that it's... seems to be somewhat of a theme for, for uh, at least yeah. certain parts of this game, if not yeah. like, from soft games yeah. in general. Cause I, there's an, a video by a guy called Brutus that goes into all the stuff about yep. like how you can tell old yarn of his changed location. Yeah, we talked about that yeah. a couple of episodes ago. Yeah, yeah. Where he he actually walks from uh, you know the entrance, the tomb entrance, to old Yarnum down to Old Yarnum itself, and then looks back and and kind of compares and contrasts. Yeah, the geography doesn't make. Yeah, any sense. how like how it it seems like we've traveled a much farther distance than you know uh, the actual travel uh, traveling would suggest. Yeah. Do you want do you want some random Old Yarnum trivia while we look at these statues? Sure. It's not called Old Yarnum in Japanese. What is it called? Old Town. Interesting. Yeah. Which I guess we'll come to in the comments, but there's a lot of weirdness around that area that got lost in translation. Yeah, interesting. Um, and so, uh, another thing that I've never done, so, uh, like I mentioned in the previous episode, that I'd never done a full clear of Yohargul. Uh, I've never done a full clear of the front yard of, of uh, Forsaken Castle Caners. So that's something that we do here. Um, oh, good. Starting, of course, with these blood liquors. So, the blood liquors, you want to speak about the blood liquors, JSF? Oh, there's a lot to talk about with the blood liquors. Um, Blood Lickers, uh, firstly, there's something that spawns in the Chalice Dungeon, because I think you've talked about this before in one of the yes. comment sections. Yeah. And, what well, and, is, and also yeah. it happened when we explored uh, yeah. uh, the Great Ice Chalice a couple yeah, of ago. Yeah, when you're nice, ago. yeah. Um, the, if you visceral attack an enemy in a Chalice Dungeon and then leave the room, there's, I think it's, it's, it's not... It's not always, but it's it's not it's that like rare either. like 10% chance or something like yeah, that. Yeah, um, that a blood licker will spawn on the spot where you visceral attack, and it'll be licking up the blood. And this area here that we're kind of looking at, it's all caved in. And I, in my head canon anyway, I think that probably leads to the chalice dungeons. That's like a caved-in chalice entrance. So it seems to me like the blood lickers have come to Kanehurst because they're attracted by all the blood that's lying around, 
uh, after the vile blood and executioners fight. Mm hmm. And, um, yeah. Because initially, like, I thought, and I think a lot of people probably thought that those are, like, the beast forms yeah. of the Kanehurst people. And they do drop Numbing Mist, so it could they be do. maybe... Maybe they did turn into them, I don't know. Maybe that's where they come from. And they, they have, like, a, 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 a Tumerian face, because I'm assuming we'll get close to one later on. We certainly do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they, they do look a lot like, um... Like, maybe the Blood Lickers... They may not have come from Kanehurst to begin well, with. Well, just but, just um, as we find yeah. them in the uh, Hunter's Nightmare, in the River of Blood, it would yeah. seem that you know they're they're attracted by large yeah, things they, of blood. Yeah, yeah, large large yeah. pools of blood. Uh, yeah, and and these things here, I probably should have looked to see what the guide refers to them as. They're called parasite worms, I think. Parasite worms. So I think they are, but I oh, I, I can't recall if if you spoke to their presence here and I really struggled uh, no, against I didn't. I wanted things. to leave them for another time because I didn't quite get them but uh, they, they're so confusing because it feels like these should be vermin but they're clearly not so do you think perhaps that they were meant to I'm, ab because yeah. the whole vermin thing was cut from the game that that was kind of the okay no, well uh, absolutely because um, like we haven't fought it yet but blood uh, blood star not blood star bloodletting beast right mhm mm very the, important. The form like, in, in Tumru Ihill. Yeah, he's got a massive one living in him. Mm -hmm. And also, he, um, when he attacks you, he has this, like, ranged poison attack. Mm -hmm. Where he shoots you, and people say, oh, he's shooting his blood at you. And it's like, no, no, if you freeze frame, he is shooting the maggots at you. Mm -hmm. He is shooting tiny little versions of those things with wings. Mm -hmm. Which and, yeah. is, is similar, I think, to, uh,. Is it the blood... Or no, no. I'm, I think I'm thinking about the same thing that you are. I, I was trying to remember who it was that first posted uh, images of that. Although I think it might it have been me. you at the same I time. I think it was... Well, I, I have posted images of it. So it might have been me. Because, yeah, the, their presence here. So we find them here. We also find them in the cave between the Forbidden Woods and Yosefka's yeah. clinic. Which looks like it was also part of the Chalice Dungeons. Yes. Uh, due to the, the tomb mold and several other things. Yeah, and then there's like all these gravestones and giants under there. And we also find them, uh, that if you don't do a certain amount of damage to the Silver Beast in the Nightmare of Mensis, they burst out of the Silver Beast. Oh, you want to know what else is creepy about them in the Silver Beast? What's that? If you get up close to a Silver Beast and you look down its throat, they're living in its throat. Oh, wow. They're, like, clinging to the inside of its throat. They look like, um, uh, there's a, there's a parasitic isopod, which, like, it lives in the mouth of a fish and it eats the fish's tongue. Oh, and then wow. it plants itself on the fish's mouth, uh, in, in the inside the fish's mouth, and it just eats when the fish is eating. It's like when the fish eats food, the so like a, a parasite, eats the like in the most literal sense, just basically yeah, it, it stealing just sits the food. in the mouth, and as the fish eats, it just eats wow. the leftover food that's left in the fish's mouth. So that's what they make me think of. So, so this whole arrangement here, then, in, in the the front yard, or uh, however you want yeah. to describe it, of, of well, Castle it looks like Kainers. a giant novelty chess game is the thing. <laughs> yeah, with all the statues and everything. Yeah, uh, but also with with the enemies, just just kind of giving the impression of a place that is infested with vermin. Yeah, because it, it like the, the blood um, bloodletting beasts. Japanese name is like much more significant. It's like Lord of the Beast Blood. Mm -hmm. So it's like clearly, like he would be the source. If there's going to be vermin in something, it was, they would be. He would be full of vermin if he's the lord of this this contaminated, corrupted blood. Mm -hmm. But then, for some reason, they changed the vermin, and the vermin are now centipedes, not maggots. So I don't know. Which, yeah, it, so it could just be that they're, uh, and yeah, I'm gonna really display my ignorance of you know the biology involved, but. It could just be that they're related forms of vermin and well, not in, necessarily in Japanese, different. Japanese, vermin is just called bug. Oh, okay. So it could be that it covers all... It covers multiple kinds of bug, yeah. and the centipedes are just the ones that we find with And vulva. so the difference then between the centipedes and the maggots would just be, like, a difference in degree as opposed to a difference necessarily yeah. in kind. Yeah. But it's, it's just... It's so confusing that they didn't... They didn't make vermin into those maggots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very, very odd. And and we can see, so something very interesting to note is that there are several different uh, types, I guess, of the blood lickers themselves. Yeah, they all have different, they're all swollen to different amounts. 
And you can see this one is quite nimble. Yeah, they, um, they're they like a tick. They like swell up with blood as they're drinking it. And the more swollen they are, the, the slower they are. So like, this is the really nimble one, and then later on, there's one that's so bloated it can't even attack you. We spend we spend a little bit of time hanging out with that yeah, one in a yeah, minute. Yeah, that, that one was a lifesaver for me when I wanted to do this because yeah. I needed one that wouldn't attack me. <laughs> you could actually and get every time close. I invaded someone in Kanehurst, they just killed me. That that was like, my even dilemma though I was as doing well. beg for life. Oh my gosh, and, and that was very much my dilemma here because I was thinking I, I couldn't remember whether or not this one actually attacks or not because. I, I suppose, like most other people, I either, for most of my playthroughs, would just run through this yard, or yeah. I would just kill it and, you know, not ask any questions. Uh, but in the interest of the playthrough, once again, I decided uh, we're going to not only clear everything, but try to take as close a look as possible. <sighs> and I, sp I spend a few, uh, I spend about a minute here testing my luck, because I still wasn't sure if it would attack me or not. Yeah. But is so so is this something that ticks are actually known to do? That is that they yeah, they gorge ticks so much on food they can't move. So even you know they have no concept of wait I've had enough blood that's it. No, because they're a parasite. So as long as there's blood, they just stick to it and they just keep drinking. So let's have a listen. So, yeah, so they're very similar in appearance to the Tumerians, but uh, who are also similar in appearance in turn to the, the Canehurst nobles. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, this this whole area basically seems to be some Tumerians went to the surface for whatever reason, and they founded this Canehurst place. And the, the uh, Canehurst nobility either are Tumerians who've started to look human because they're not taking Tumerian blood, or they... It's like Tumerians interbreeding with humans or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And and uh, there's also the other connection, uh, which you <laughs> added <laughs> in, in an addendum to uh, your Kaner's episode. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll get to uh, that when we get to the Yeah, to the, the, the dining room. Yeah. Uh, with the bell ringing women, there's a connection there as well. Yeah. Which, and again, the chalices we learned is another in... really important chalice connection. Mm-hmm. And mm. which we learned when we explored the, the Great Eyes Chalice. And I, I actually handsome. noticed another Tumerian connection, which I'll bring up when we get to it. Interesting. And and yeah, like, I almost felt bad <laughs> killing this, because, uh, you know, he, he just didn't want any part of it. And I was looking to see what... And so they all appeared to be uh, Healing Church corpse models. Well, the which, problem is... Yeah. Yeah. Does that find, include executioners? You find, you find Kanehurst stuff on those bodies, and you find executioner stuff on those bodies. So the corpse model doesn't actually tell us what kind of... Uh, whether they came from the Healing Church or from Kanehurst, because they both use the same corpse model. Oh, interesting. So you have to go off what's on the corpse. And like, oh, I think this is Numbing Mist on that that's one. That's really odd. And, and I was There's pointing Numbing out Mist here on that, that one. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And I was pointing out here that you can actually see the difference in the blood pools... So numbing mist throw to create a mist cloud that numbs our hunter's life essence and prevents restoration of HP, said to be used by the blood hunters of Kanehurst. Its recipe is a secret closely guarded by the line of nobles inhabiting the castle. Uh, and yeah, so so as I was saying, that you can actually yeah. see an enormous difference between the pool of blood that is left by one of those nimble blood yeah. lickers and the pool of blood that's left by yeah. one that has just gorged itself to being yeah. uh, completely immobile. Yeah. So, like, there we had a we had the same corpse model, but one had a numbing mist and one had frenzied cold blood. Mm -hmm. So it looks to me like that was probably a a Kanehurst hunter with the... A it, it's really the, interesting that they wouldn't num, have made yeah, that distinction with the corpse models. Well, they just don't seem to have... It's like likely it just wasn't finished. Yeah. Because Dark Souls does the same thing. There's like... There's... Every single corpse model is the same male hollow, except... There's I, Illusory Wall did a post on this, where there's like... I think There's three one in the, the four, lower, lower yeah. undead burg, the female there's corpse model. There's three or four female corpse models yeah. in the entire of Dark Souls. 
The only one I, he, I know for sure is the one in the lower Undead Burg who uh, lower guarded Undead by a bunch Berg, of draglings um, with a twin the, humanity. Yeah, and the, there's like the a couple of fire keepers and Raya. Hmm. So that's three or four. So yeah, it, like, and, and it's it's kind of disappointing just given how much information you should be able to glean yeah. from the corpse model used. Uh, yeah. And and I was very hopeful initially in this game when it seemed like there was, and there is a greater variety of them. Yeah, definitely. But still, you the would one think choir that, corpse model that's used once. Which the one in the upper cathedral? Yahargul. Or sorry, Yahargul, right? Where you get the There's upper one cathedral ward choir, key. Yeah. Interesting. And and then yeah, when you go to the upper cathedral ward, all of the the corpses just there just just healing again. church. Interesting. Yeah. Because yeah, that's something you think that they would have yeah uh, devoted a little bit more attention to. I'm sure they meant to, and they just because the whole game is is like clearly they were running out of time for quite a substantial portion of it. So yeah. <laughs> I had a fair bit of trouble clearing the enemies here, as you can see, based on my yeah. my uh, quicksilver bullets and yeah. blood vial cannons. And you're ripping off my tactic of just chasing everything with the fucking black sky eye. And and also, I don't know if you noticed, but the first time I've used the the uh, minigun as well. Well, the Gatling gun's the beautiful. Gatling gun. Pardon me. Yeah, because because uh, once again, I watched your your uh, Kanehurst up close video bef almost immediately before recording this, just to remind myself of some of the things that you raised in that episode, yeah. to make sure that I actually like devoted, you know, uh, looked at those things so that we could talk about them. And I was like, oh, he he used the um, I think it was you you were using the Gatling gun on the um, blood liquors. on the blood liquors. Yeah. And so this, I assume, is the, the is supposed to represent the king and the queen king of Kanehurst. Queen of Kanehurst. Yeah. So we can hear the weeping of the, the noble women of Kanehurst, yep. um, who, as you pointed out in your, your Bloodborne up close, if you look close to, if you look closely at them, and uh, I wasn't able to look as closely at them as you were able to in that video, but you can see that their throats are slit, uh, presumably, yeah. and, and that they also have blindfolds on, presumably at the hands of the executioners, correct? Yeah, definitely. Well, this is one of the problems I ran into, because... They have blindfolds on, they have cutthroats. Later on, we'll find ones that literally their head is detached from their body. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they were blindfolded and executed at a, like a guillotine or something. Mm -hmm. But the executioners seem to use Ligarius's wheel as a weapon, which you can't decapitate someone with. And also that they, they you know, uh, they, I believe the executioner's gauntlets suggest that, you know, their adoration of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah. Which is odd because we yeah, we never come across that, and and it looks very much like they're wearing the um, the Kaner's noble, noble dress, dress right? Yeah. yeah, but just in ghost color, I guess. Yeah. And very very reminiscent once again, uh, just another Dark Souls similarity to to the the ghosts in um, New, New London. the New Londa ruins. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Right down to the weapon that they use and everything. Yeah, I was actually thinking the weapon reminds me a lot of when uh, when Bell Maidens try to melee you. Yeah, and and also yeah. when um, and this is something you raised in the Urden video. Also when uh, Adela Adela tries to attack yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, in in that it's it's kind of ineffectual. Like the the, the yeah. and and this year I recall in a live stream I don't recall who mentioned it but someone connected that animation and, and or looked at that animation and said that it's almost like they're summoning the ghosts, but something that yeah. you said, and I think I agree with this, is that uh, it suggests that perhaps they're used to being abused by the nobles. And they're like, ca they're cowering before the old nobility. Because they realize oh shit, they're so he's here. cowering facing a statue. So we picked up the Rider Palash, uh, which is a weapon wielded by the Knights of Kanehurst. Combines an elegant knight's sword with the peculiar firearm wielded by the Kanehurst Order. The old nobles, longtime imbibers of blood, are no strangers to the sanguine plague, and the disposal of beasts was a discreet task left to their servants or knights, as they were called for the sake of appearances. 
And so this uh, weapon here is is um, the reason, if you've noticed for the first time, I think since we first picked up, uh, since we were in the, the Forbidden Woods, is why we're using the weapon that we're using. That is the... Well, I should do a little demonstration of the moveset first. Yeah, the rifle sphere, pardon me. And uh, I actually embarrassingly didn't even realize that uh, this was actually one-handed. I assumed that it was simply oh, yeah. that that it was two-handed, much like the rifle spear. I've actually never used the Rider Palish. It, neither have I. And and so I always noted, like, I thought that the, the similarities were interesting, but I thought yeah. it was kind of a waste to have two different weapons in a game with so few weapons to begin with. And, like, it tells us the rifle spear is derived from the Rider Palish. Yes. Like, it's a, so, yeah, this is like a, a connection between Kanehurst and the Healing Church. Which, they were able to like grab a uh, rider right palace while with they the were sieging the place specifically, which yeah. is a very odd connection. So the the description reads: we a trick weapon crafted by the workshop heretics, the powder kegs, a prototype weapon serving as a simple firearm and spear, possibly created in imitation of a lost Kanehurst weapon. Lacks any notable functions except for its notable function that it's the only trick <laughs> trick weapon with an attached gun. I always thought that was a silly way of opening yeah. that sentence. Yeah. But but why the powder kegs of all the the factions within the church? That was something I was yeah. thinking about. That I, I guess just they looked at it and they're like, "Wow, that's." Well, the powder kegs are obsessed with kick. just like machinery. Yeah, if it ain't got so kick, like, it ain't worth wow, using or whatever. Yeah. And so they they saw kind of the the mixture of the old and new yeah. that the the writer posh represented, and they and, loved Final Fantasy VIII. I know the gunblade <laughs> is the coolest thing. <laughs> Well That's said. why they were heretics. So everyone's like Final Fantasy VIII. Shit. Yeah. Like, no, you're wrong. They're Squall fanboys. That's for oh, sure. It's disgusting. <laughs> and and yeah, just this place is it. It really does. And this is something that lots of people have said. But it, it does feel as though it belongs more in a Dark Souls game than it does in Bloodborne. It feels very much like if they went back and did Demon Souls for PS4. Mm -hmm. This is what Volataria mm -hmm. would kind of be like. Oh, and so here's one of the quote-unquote yeah. knights, but this one, whereas we come across one later who actually has a writer palish, yeah. this one is just using... It's, He's got this cane. Yeah. Which, which like, uh, there's two different canes. Because there's also the ones that that have the blow yeah. darts, right? It works like a blow dart, and that guy is just using it. To, and for all we know, they're actually like a trick weapon, but we only ever see them use one form. Mm-hmm. But mm. I, I thought it was odd, like... It, I'm, does that guy always aggro onto you no matter what, or did I hit him by accident um, or something? There? I think it's to do with how close you are. Because the the rest of them remain passive until, at least in this first yeah. area, uh, unless you attack them. And so I wanted to see here whether he had the same weapon and he did it. And so like, the, uh, that healing church corpse model was in like a praying position facing the statue the same way as that servant was. Oh, interesting. And it dropped Madman's knowledge. That makes me think, like, is that a, an old Kanehurst retainer who was, like, praying Yeah. as he yeah. died? Yeah. Which, again, really just accentuates the the disappointment at the fact that, you know, yeah. they, they couldn't have used more specific corpse models. Yeah. But, yeah, and then there are so many. And and so part of that is... is yeah, like gameplay considerations, of course, because you know this is—it's not a late game area, but yeah. you know it's—it's. It's As you can see, they, they give off the same smoke effect, kind of that the carriage does. Oh, touche! Yeah, that's but right. But they have a—they have a flinch animation. Yeah, so so now now we are in the the, the dining, dining hall or dining room, uh, which and it's in quite a state. 
Yeah, like it seems like almost it's, it's as been though... abandoned mid feast. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I was trying to, uh, but I couldn't even think of the words to that. It was almost like the the executioner showed up and everyone just you know, up and up and left. Yeah, to exactly. try and defend the castle. Yeah, um, because well, I guess part of it was just I was trying to you know, something like this is so otherworldly to me that that, that you would have these statues on, the. Dining room table. Well, those statues show up in the Chalice Dungeons. Do they? Which yes. ones? Uh, both of them. On the, the you know, those, those where you tend to find ritual materials, there's like a big altar behind with a red cloth. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Those those statues are sometimes on that cloth. Oh wow! I've Which never is another, noticed that. Um. Yeah. Connection Kane-Hurst between Chalice Dungeon K- connection. Yeah. Wow. I I never noticed that because I guess it, like when you enter one of those rooms. You're always just thinking, okay, let's get the ritual materials and get out of here yep. as fast as possible. So we picked up the... Noble dress. Noble dress, which reads, A finely tailored Bordeaux dress, worn by the nobles of the old bloodline that traces back to the forsaken castle Canehurst. So, as I'm sure everyone knows at this point, not only is that the dress that the ghost women are wearing that we're currently fighting, but also that Ariana. of Ariana. And also, so, this, why don't you this speak to the portraits arm, here? Right. Uh, this particular arm, oh, we can't see anymore. That that particular armor set shows up in the chalice dungeons on the corpses you find. You will find armored mm-hmm. corpses in the chalice dungeons and that like have that exact armor set. propped up by, like, the, the yeah, bones and stuff like that. if you like look that. at them, it's the same armor set. That's obviously the knight set. The knight set, yeah. Yep. Some, That's the commemorative plate. With... Caners, which is just so I can just see an infomercial for that. Yep. And that's that's one of the ghosts. It's so just one of the noble women, and this yeah, is the portrait that yeah. some suggest could be could Ariana, be Ariana, and Annalise, which is very interesting. It is interesting, but it, it's sort of hard to tell. Uh, yeah, the guy off the um, left hand side looks kind of like. He's wearing the Kanehurst Knight set. No, not Kanehurst, the Kanehurst set. That mm-hmm. is a Bell Maiden that we're looking at now. Which is mind blowing. She is dressed, she's wearing a Bell Maiden's uh, armor set, and you can she see the that, bells. like, there is a hood, but it's like she's got it off at the moment. It's, it's round her back. And um, she might have bells, you can't see her hands. And and uh, more or less, uh, so even though it's red, um, the the bell maidens that we found in the one reborn boss reborn. Room were in fact wearing uh, red, a red yeah, they're, dress they're like a that. Special kind that are, and they they also do that fireball thing, which um, bell the bell maidens don't. Which I I really uh, about halfway through the one reborn boss fight when I almost had devastated the boss, I realized at that point, maybe I should have stopped and let him show off some of his moves a little bit more. Yeah. Which is why I let Defector Antel take him on by himself for a little bit. <laughs> and I unfortunately got a little bit carried away in this, um, in, in the boss fight coming up in this episode as well. Right. Part of the, the, the blessing and the curse of being incredibly overleveled. See, now, property destruction. Just adding to the list of crimes. Oh. <laughs> And yeah, it's just it's just really striking how uh, you know it was almost as if so in a way kind of similar to what ha- what happened at your Hargul, uh, yeah. but perhaps in a less uh, otherworldly sense where it's almost like everyone. No, just I'd say this vanished. is pretty otherworldly. There's ghosts yeah. and vampires. <laughs> touche, touche. But I mean, in terms of the the practical implications of of them just kind of getting up and and leaving in the middle of dinner because you know they're yeah definitely yeah you you can picture it as being not necessarily a very magical it, it uh, kind of looks like the fighting is sort of gradually forces the nobles basically along the path we're taking. Hmm. So, so this so is like the path they're, they're the nobles would back. have taken. They're forced back until because the final area is obviously Annalise's throne room. Hmm. So it's like the nobles were just gradually forced back by the executioners until. It was pretty much just Annalise left, it seems like. That's fascinating. That's really, really fascinating. And so coming up here, uh, we have our first encounter with one of the cargoyles. And this this guy here still gets me from time to time because he blends yeah. in so well with the statues. Yeah. Uh, and so I believe this was one of the... You mentioned that this this could also have been... So in the similar vein to what you were thinking initially with the blood liquors, that yeah. maybe this is similar to like the beast form for... Well, I think it is because if you look at the... Um 
the facial hair it's got it's the same as the facial hair in the portraits yes yes uh, especially that one that that you were talking about that i just kind of pinned yeah. right by yeah that it looks but the practic- weird thing is um like i talk about this when, when i uh, talk about them but they they're not a beast mechanically it's like we were talking about ibrius mm-hmm. technically being kin those technically mm-hmm. aren't beasts or kin mm-hmm that you don't get any kind of damage bonus. So, so it's them. more more of like an analog to a beast form as opposed to a beast form specifically. Uh, it could be just that the beast forms differ from place to place, and like Yarn and beast forms are weak against serration. These ones aren't. I don't know. And so, so this is the the first kind of glimpse we get uh, from up top of. Ah, yes. And I was I was somewhat impressed, um, in spite of what I said in uh, past episodes about the things being rendered at a distance, that you could actually see all of the pools of blood rendered in full detail yeah. from up here. Which, yeah, it's it's very interesting. I, I can't really wrap my mind around... Well, he's a bat, so he's doing, like, a screeching thing. Oh, touche. And so so the statues, and, and this is something I've been thinking about that... Um, I believe it was uh, Bonfire Side Chat, the episode they did way back when on uh, Sense Fortress. They joked about Sense Fortress being sort of a... And there's a Canehurst sigil. Yeah. They joked about it being, like, a sto- uh, statue storage facility. <laughs> Yeah, um, there are a lot of statues and they don't really seem to serve a purpose. It's one of those, like, video game design things where just maybe they just wanted it to look sort of opulent and gothic, so they copy-pasted the same statue over and over again. Yeah. Um, and and uh, something I didn't point out there, but uh, I, I believe there's another copy and paste of it coming up here, is that, yeah, some of these statues are pushed over and, like, yeah. the head's removed from them. Yeah. So suggesting perhaps, like, like as an act of de- desecration committed by the executioners mm. as they were driving the Canehurst nobles back. Um, or it could just be that they were knocked over in the fighting. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of them still have the head, so it, it may not be deliberate. That's true. That's true. Like, I, like just, we talk, I think I'm, I'm projecting yeah. too much on the basis of uh, the the Troy movie, where. <laughs> where... Well, no, I remember in uh, Upper Cathedral Ward, there's those very very Tumerian looking statues that yeah. actually have like a thing of cloth like tied over the top of them, so you can't see them. And that looks deliberate. Yes. This just looks like they fell over. Oh, here we go. The the part okay, where I realized everything was really confusing. <laughs> Executioner garb, attire worn by the band of executioners commanded by the martyr Logarius, later became the basis for all church attire with its heavy draping of holy shawl. As the great Logarius once said, acts of goodness are not always wise and acts of evil are not always foolish, but regardless, we shall always strive to be good. And the gauntlets, as I mentioned earlier, uh, point out that the... um, the brass rivets are unique to the executioners and reflect their adoration of hand-to-hand combat, which is something I find very odd because 
you know, at no point do we encounter, like, when we first come across, uh, when we first come across Alfred, Alfred, who's really the only living executioner, uh, yeah, other than, uh, Logarius, who we come across, and Logarius, I don't know, you can really even say he's alive, uh, but he uses the, the hunter's axe. Yeah. And so I was thinking that, you know, it might have been a nice touch if perhaps he was like a Steelheart Ellie from Dark Souls 2 <laughs> fighting hand-to-hand -hand or something like that. Well, if they just fight hand-to-hand, they basically just mean melee combat, like up close. That makes sense. And so we also picked up the Vile Blood Register, which uh, is a record of cheaters in practice, but <laughs> the item description reads, Red Leather Record of the Vile Bloods Loyal to the Covenant of Annalise, Queen of the Vile Bloods at Canehurst Castle. A record of the Vile Bloods, bloodlusting hunters who seek blood dregs of their prey kept throughout the ages. So because I was unable to actually get my hands on some blood dregs in this episode, uh, we have Scrubbing. the description here, which reads, The blood, vile bloods of Canehurst, bloodlusting hunters, see these frightful things in cold blood. They often appear in the blood of echo fiends, that is to say, the blood of hunters. Queen Annalise partakes in these blood drag offerings, so that she may one day bear the child of blood, the next vile blood heir. Yep. And so, something you pointed out about the look of oh, the blood dregs in, in your up-close video is... Mm. That they, they look like sperm, right? Well, to be fair, that wasn't just me. I think it's... A lot of people were pointing that out at the time. Not something I noticed, so... Oh, okay. Credit well, to all those people you've, you've as got well. got a cleaner mind than I do. <laughs> or just I was so overwhelmed by how confused I was with the storyline of the game at that point. Oh, God. And so there's something that I thought was simply absurd when it was first... Um, I, I think it was during the Community Pacifist run, when we were... Um, going through this area, and I point out here that that is corruption the rune. corruption rune. Yeah. It's and the corruption I, rune, and it's also a reference to Berserk, uh, Miyazaki's manga thing. Mm -hmm. Because in Berserk, uh, the main character is he's branded in the same way with a different rune on the back of his neck. Mm -hmm. And it draws demons to him. So here what happens is those ghosts will basically be passive, um, unless you get really close to them, unless you have the corruption rune on you. And that's what triggers them to actually, like, know where you are. Oh, okay. Interesting. So that's what it's... Yeah, and they become oh. a lot more aggressive. And... So here I was, I was looking... Uh, I didn't realize that... Or I'd, I'd forgotten that I wouldn't have had the moon at that point, given where yeah. we are. But... Yeah. Um, but... So... it But it gets... Kind of burned into the back of our minds like that because yeah. of the dark blowing servants, right? Yeah. Because, like, I've, I've got a... A, th a great annoying waste of time. I was able to record, see what the darts actually look like, and I think they might. It, it might be the same principle as quicksilver bullets, where quicksilver bullets um, are um, combined with your blood when you fire them, which is why blood tinge governs rain dam range damage. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they're mixing their little silver darts with their own Canehurst blood, which is corrupt. So when the dart hits you, you get the corruption ring. Which is fascinating because uh, when. So as I was mentioning, yeah, when when I was uh, doing a live stream and going through this place, and someone, you know, I always thought that it was the the noble women with. I always thought it was the noble women with the uh, with their head in their hands, no. who were were triggering the that I guess burning of the corruption rune into the back of our minds. But and when someone mentioned, no, it's the the, the dark blowing guys, I thought that's absurd. There's no way. <laughs> But what I did there was I slowed it down to show that, yeah, it was almost immediately after we were hit by that dark. Yeah, yeah. That that rune shows up in the back of our minds. Or I guess more more accurately, the back of our heads. Yeah. The back of our brains. Even though even though it does say mind, but I don't know. In practice, well, no, because I, if we put a Carol rune in our mind, we don't see it on the back of our head. Yeah. So I guess uh, it is like physically stuck to the back of our neck. So, like suggesting that this is more of a temporary etching well, of that room. It does rune. go away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas when we use the 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 Carol Rune tool uh, or the Carol Rune Workshop tool, that we're we're doing it on a more permanent basis. And, and this whole thing about Carol Runes is that they don't rely on blood, which is why Willem liked them, or would hmm. have. Except for the ones that do, though. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh. which throws a whole yeah but and i like something and this is something that we talked about um but that we we subsequently had to cut out of the last time you were on was yeah uh i, I believe you were saying it was redgrave's suggestion that 
carol rune, that term, seems to be used in the game in a similar way that we use the term band-aids. Yeah, or, or um, here, sticky tape. Or, or to Google something. Yeah, it's... Where, um, it, it's, hmm. it, it's like a brand name that, that, you know, kind of becomes a part of yeah. the popular lexicon. They, they're called carol runes because carol, like, perfected how to do them. But not every single rune was transcribed by carol. Although the, the item's descriptions do say left by Carol Runesmith of Bergen. No, but the is thing is, like, but we in... see, like, milkweed being created. Carol's not yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Touché, touché. So, yeah, so I, I like that way of looking at it. I think that that makes it a lot easier to actually wrap your head around it. So credit, of course, to Redgrave for making that suggestion. Or for I actually, raising um, that idea. There's a bunch of stuff Redgrave says about Kanehurst, and I messaged him to ask if it was okay if I brought it up. And he hasn't replied yet. I'm so, sure he's um, fine with it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up. <laughs> uh, and so this here, and I don't know if this is a term that translates to your your part of the world, but yellow <laughs> snow? Um, yes, I, I'm aware of the term. And this guy was still moving and breathing for some reason. He's, but... he's This looks drunk. <laughs> Him and Lawrence. But so so that's, what, that's meant to imply that there's urine there, right? That someone's... Someone's urinated on. Um, I just thought it was blood. I didn't the, think it was the yellow. yellow parts there. Uh, I don't. Is no, is but, that not the reflection of your lantern? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, because it's it's always on those same the, like the texture is oh, always yeah, there. Oh okay. yeah. And we I also find that. we also find a yellow puddle underneath where Logarius is sitting. Oh Jesus. <laughs> so yeah. That this is the Thimerian connection I didn't get when I first made it, but when you were locked uh, into that like grab attack thing where you had the the like halo of light around you, mm -hmm. Yarnum does that attack. So yeah, that Yarnum does that. Oh. When you're fighting as, Yarnum, as does the the um, the brain suckers as well. Is it the same animation for the brain suckers? Uh, almost exactly the same. I'm yeah. almost certain of it. Yeah. Which is very interesting. Yeah. So executioner's gloves. One of the secret treasures hidden in Kanehurst, the gloves of an executioner from a faraway land. Passed from executioner father to executioner son, these gloves can be used to summon wrathful spirits of the past by smearing them with blood. It is said that the nobles found a measurable delight in the dances of these vengeful specters. So that suggested to me that almost like the there was like an executioner that served almost like a court jester or... Um, like, what is the implication there? Well, it, it seems to me more like it's just a sadistic thing. Mm hmm Like, I mean, delight doesn't mean that they found it funny. They're just mm -hmm. like... Ah, ha, ha. But... <sighs> Cartoonish supervillainy. And when you slow it down, you can you can see the, yeah, the skulls much skulls. in the same way that... Yeah, so it's the same attack that... Or, or uh, a similar attack to that which Logaris uses on yep. us, but he obviously has a much more and, powerful um, version. And the, uh, the fish people shamans. Mm -hmm. when they do but their theirs, little, theirs is purple, purple. as opposed... It's purple, yeah. but it's the same asset. Oh, here's yeah. the, here's the um, decapitated one. And so we'll get to see once again that, that animation. And so maybe I'll put up a side-by-side -side of... See, I think the difference is that when the, the brain suckers do it, it's a projectile attack that hits you. Yeah. Whereas with her and Yarnum, it's just if you're in front of them. Yes, yeah. And Yarnum's yeah, uh, is a lot stronger, and she's able to lift you up in the air and drop you. Interesting. Yeah. So suggesting perhaps, so uh, like, I guess further to your point from earlier, that um, you know maybe the, the Kanehurst is, is somewhat of a, a, a race of diluted Tumerians. Well, to, Redgrave Tumerians and I actually had this blood. whole like really long discussion about what the origin would actually be. Mm -hmm. mm, because the thing is, you're told, um, God, I think it's the Thumaru Ihil root, tells you that um, the Thumerians originally, or Tumerians, sorry, didn't have a, a leader. They were just like a race of servants serving the Great Ones. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was, they got kind of ideas above their station, and they named themselves a queen. Mm -hmm. which, who is presumed, it's either Yarnum or whoever came before Yarnum. But mm -hmm. this is clearly a, a monarchy. Kanehurst, it's got a queen. So it's almost like these are the, the Tumerians that named themselves a queen. Like, oh, and, very and interesting. went to the surface. Yeah. That there was some kind of like Tumerian civil war or something. So like an offshoot or something. 
Yeah. So the knight's garb reads, reads uh, attire of the knights of Canehurst, a regal piece graced by intricate goldwork. The Canehurst way is a mix of nostalgia and bombast. They take great pride even in the bloodstained corpses of beasts that they leave behind, confident that they will stand as examples of decadent art. So I guess that's the answer to my question from earlier, the the bombast part uh, yeah. of the link, you know, why the um, – and and the trousers made with the finest leather. And, and yeah. they're actually my favorite trousers in the game, so we pop those on real quick. <laughs> but what it actually uh, tells you, this is the important part, is it mentions all the stuff about Kanehurst hunting beasts. Mm-hmm. So that shows that, okay, this beast thing, this is not unique to Yana. Because that was that something, something that was quite confusing to begin with seemingly cyclical that it's happening over and over and over no, but even even that it seems to happen in places that aren't Yarnum, like at different times because you have reference to like the the constables chasing the beast to Yarnum. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So to chase it to Yarnum has to have come from somewhere else that it's not localized specifically that yeah, Yarnum, but it's, you know at the yeah. beginning of the game you keep hearing that uh, like um, Gilbert tells us this, th- and this town is cursed and yeah the mobs cursed. also say the same thing yeah so <laughs> You should really be a voice actor. <laughs> but, uh, so suggesting that, yeah, it's a much more widespread problem in this world. Uh, and so, you know, yeah. although we don't really know Yeah, because it's almost like about. beasts are just a known thing, but Yarnum's got too many of them. Yeah. Th- th- yeah. Th- th- it, it, it gets to the point where it's actually kind of interfering with the civic order, I guess. Yeah. Whereas yeah, the, elsewhere... The more I look it's... at Kanehurst, I'm just thinking, this is all stuff I hoped the DLC would answer, and it ignored completely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, completely yeah. sidestepped it. So, uh, and, you know, I guess, I, like, I have no problem with just kind of taking it as it is. Because yeah. I, I think the game would certainly be worse off were it not for. Yeah. And and also, um, it certainly helps. W- without Kaners, it would have been very difficult to understand um, Hang on. Oh, this is a, Lady, yeah. Lady Maria. Um, there's another Redgrave point. You find a lot of kin cold blood here. Mm-hmm. And this is, me and Redgrave differ on this. Um he says that, you know, the Nightmare Executioners in the Hunter's Nightmare, right? Mm-hmm. They're big, uh, big guys with axes, and they've got tentacle faces with, like, this vortex effect. Mm-hmm. So he says that that's because those are the Executioners that stormed Kano's, and they were kin. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, my take on it is that because the Kanehurst nobility seem to be descended from Tumerians, that they, they were imbibing so much, but they were becoming kin. Hmm. So it's, yeah, either either one works, basically. Interesting. Uh, so something I neglected to pick up first time through this room is the Evelyn, Evelyn, which reads, Special pistol used by Canehurst Knights. The Evelyn uses Quicksilver bullets just as any workshop firearm, but the Canehurst variant relies more on blood tinge. Lovingly named after a woman and graced with an intricate design, Evelyns were adorned by Canehurst Knights. Hmm. Or adored, rather, not yeah. adorned. Um, yeah, but I guess... It's it's hard because to to just say imbibe with blood is kind of general when it seems that yeah. you know to ascend kin if we were to go with Redgrave's uh, you know view that something like Yosefka's blood vial represents kind of this distillation of the beast from the blood such that mm. you know when injected when when you use that when you imbibe with that blood that you become kin it, it kind of strips away the beast from within you yeah. Uh, so well, Yosefka herself kind of, not Yosefka, imposter Yosefka, she mm-hmm. kind of hints at that because she talks about how, like, when she's on the table and she's writhing around, she says, I'm not beast, this shows that I'm chosen. So it's like she knows she's transforming. But And she, and she also says when you go back um, after, when, when you go there, she warns you to go away and then you return or when you send another subject to her and then you return to the door and she uh, you know, gives that whole speech about the this time of I'm trying old blood. Yeah, and she says to the discovery of kinship. Yeah. So, so she's trying to kind of... She looks like she's trying to make herself kin or something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that, that she's using the, the subjects that you send her as a means... Because, you know, as again, medis- subject, medicine yeah. is a means of research and not, uh, not a method of treatment. Yeah. So that, yeah, she's she's... Yeah, very interesting. Well, I, like, we obviously are going to return to yeah. Yosefka's clinic for a third time in this playthrough, which is really? not something I expected to happen. Uh, and so we'll have plenty of time to talk about that later on. But now we're finally at the point where... Um, yeah, here, here, this is this guy's got red eyes. 
which is this really is, odd. This is part of why I say that they're beasts, even though the game doesn't agree with me. Because um, <laughs> the beasts in Old Yarnum, they will get red glowing eyes exactly like this when they're like mm -hmm. feasting on blood. Mm -hmm. um, as well people, as the yeah. the old hunters in the Hunter's Nightmare, yeah. the ones who drop vermin have red eyes as well. Yeah, it looks like this is like a sign that you've, you've imbibed too much blood. And because we find this, this guy's over a corpse. Pure as well. This guy's over a corpse, so it looks like um, they ate. They were eating that corpse, and they're kind of getting of high off the blood. Knight too, which yeah, is very yeah. interesting. Well, see, this makes me think those are the beasts that it talks about the Canehurst Knights getting rid of. Because the other ones, you could almost make the case that they're defending the castle yeah. by by kind of blending in with the scenery, and whereas, yeah, these ones are very explicitly seem to have. Uh, yeah, turned on this Canehurst knight. Yeah, or just that they they blend into the scenery to hunt Canehurst knights. Hmm. Also, a dormant prized by the knights of Canehurst resembles a ponytail of silver hair. The Canehurst way is a mix of nostalgia and bombast, and they take great pride even in the bloodstained corpses of beasts. Yeah. Uh, so basically, the, the yeah. last little bit is yeah. is uh, yeah. identical to the rest of the set. Yeah. But and um, who has silver hair? Yeah, uh, Lady Maria and. Prior to the DLC, the doll. So, so that yeah. is this is the broken bridge that you were talking oh, about, right? No, no, no. This is a different broken. The, the broken bridge I was talking about before is the bridge to the mainland. Oh, sorry. I mean, in in your your oh, King yeah. Earth, uh, yeah. up close video. Yeah, this is this is like because you see what we're going to Annalise's throne room by kind of being Batman a and going over all path. these rooftops. Yeah. yeah, it looks like that was the original way you got to. Annalise's throne room. There was like so stairs or something up there. And it's what been I was destroyed. trying to figure out here, though, is where the heck, like, what the heck that bridge even connects to. Yeah, it's it's. But you because can it doesn't, see, it doesn't like, seem to actually go stuff. anywhere. Because like you can see, kind of now, there's all these like buttresses and towers and things that are part of the castle that we never go to. Mm hmm. Mm. But this one is especially because, like, you look over there and and like where, <laughs> where where does it connect? You know. I don't know. Uh, because. And I watched watched that part of your video twice, trying to see like, was he able to figure this out? So that, no. that's why I spent so much time looking at it because it, yeah, it was just very confusing uh, because it it doesn't seem to actually connect any, or uh, at any point to have connected to anything. But the implication, uh, as you pointed out in that video, seems to be that it was destroyed. Uh, yeah, it was presumably by Logarius or Logarius. Yeah, it looks men. like they they wrecked the bridge to the mainland. They wrecked the way to get to Annalise, and then Logarius turned himself into a martyr. To Make sure so absolutely all, all no in one... the interest, yeah, yeah, of ensuring that no one yeah. even comes into contact with her. And we're now undoing all their hard work. <laughs> What's in the interest of the Lord Logarius? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, Bold Hunter's Mark's there, which I've always interpreted as just, you know, if you're here, thing. if you happen to be yeah. here and you're very low level, you might want to get out of here. Yeah. Um, this boss was in my blind playthrough. Uh, I think I came here three separate times. Uh, the first two times left with my tail between my legs because I'm just like, I, I can't beat him right now. Yeah, he is, he is very, very tough.
so this is what I was talking about earlier. Yellow you can snow. actually see yeah. yellow snow. Yeah. So, you know, because the implication there being that he'd been there for so long just the, sitting there. And, like, you can see he's basically a corpse yeah. at this point. Uh, that, yeah, the, the urine's just and... sort of pulled under his, his chair. Well, there. that happens when, like, yeah, when you die, you're, yeah, your yeah. bowels just there's no muscle anymore. Just, so they just, just kind like, of release. Yeah, and I don't know why I was so fixated on it, but it's just an interesting piece of environmental detail. Well, Maybe I, it's just just a Canadian it. thing. The whole yeah. like when I was a kid learning, you know, the don't, stay away from yellow, yellow snow, snow. Don't eat yellow snow. Seems well, like something that shouldn't is, need is to be brown. said, but or brown. Yeah, but the snow here is brown. Crown of Illusions, one of the precious secrets of Kanehurst. The old king's crown is said to reveal illusions and expose a mirage that hides a secret. And so Logarius donned the crown of his own volition, determined to prevent a single soul from stumbling upon the vile secret. What visions did he see, sitting serenely upon his new throne? So, yeah, so just, just like we were, we were talking about with the bridge, that, you know, Logarius committed himself to just ensuring that no one would... Yeah come across Annalise. Yeah, it looks um, to me like he's mummified himself. Interesting. You'll, you'll have to speak more about that uh, in a minute, because okay. I want to hear about that. Yeah, we were just talking about the, the weird mechanics of the crown. And um, if you go back to, like, old trailers, you can see there's a very brief shot of a skull with a crown on it. And it looks to me like maybe the crown was originally found somewhere else. I don't know. Yeah, so again, just r this whole area re just suggesting uh, and hinting at cut content, cut everywhere. and or repurpose oh. content. Yeah, here we go, the right and leg. And so something, yeah, that you pointed out in your, your Kanehurst Up Close video is is the as the old hunter's trousers, old hunter trousers later told us, yep. uh, Beast Blood was thought to creep up the right leg, although they, all it, of the horses still have stirrups on the right side. Yeah, it, it just looks like a, something that they never bothered fixing, like a mistake. Because someone left a comment, which I, I thought, oh, that's interesting, for a because he said, no, 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 it's not that they didn't have right legs is that the armor doesn't have right legs because the right legs where you inject a blood vial. Oh, but that's a But then if you look at them, they actually, the, the armor actually goes down to the thigh. Oh, So it okay. actually would have gotten in the way. Yeah. Because it, it would make sense if it was just the shin that was guarded and not the thigh, but from the way we look at it. Maybe they just got a wholesale deal on... on, <laughs> on uh, yeah, they realized they could save... It's like a min-maxing yeah, thing. Yeah, they, if they just bought with bought bought the uh, what do they call the things that you sit on? Horses. No, the 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 things <laughs> the stirrups are attached to. I have no saddle. The saddle, yeah. That that they you know it would be more expensive to buy saddles with one stirrup than two oh, or something. True. I don't know. Visitor, I claim no subject, but here lieth our throne. Kneel afore us. Or get thee gone. So yeah, our first ah. we finally come across the vile secret, Annalise herself. And yep. uh, in the interest of, of you know the spirit of this episode, um, we basically we try a lot of different things here. So there's going to be uh, yeah. only one I can one see the time restore line. point, but uh, we pick up the which I it took me a while to find unopened for summons. some reason unopened summons an old sealed summons like the first of its kind it is an invitation to Kanehurst but for whom is not known as it lacks an addressee uh, which is interesting because yeah because the, the, the summons that we got is specifically addressed to us yeah and it looks like the um you need the summons to get here but you don't have to like be approved of you just need to have this like it's a like it, like it invokes and summons the carriage or something. It's like a bearer bond almost. Yeah, like you just yeah. You just need to have it in your hands. Yeah. Visitor. 
moon-scented hunter. I am Annalise, queen of Castle Canehurst. <laughs> Ruler of the vile bloods and sworn enemy of the church. Yet our people are murdered and we are prisoner to this wretched mask. What is it thou art in search of? Well, well. An odd hunter thou art indeed. We've tired of these piteous nights. Share in our plight and take oath against the church. If thou wouldst this path walk, I prithee, partake of my rotted blood. Very well. Drink deep of our blood. Feel the spreading corruption burn. <laughs> Now, thou art too a vile blood. We too, the very last on this earth. We await thy return for the honor of Cainhurst. So yeah, yep. lots to talk about there, um, but we're going to save it for just a little bit uh, as the events here play out because okay. uh, there's a lot of stuff that's about to happen. Uh, first, the Canehurst Badge, Badge of the Royal Guards of Canehurst, Loyal Guardians of the Vileblood Queen Annalise. Vilebloods are hunters of blood and hunt prey as they search for blood drags. The hunter who joins them is faced with a decision to merely borrow their strength or to become one of them, heart and soul. That last sentence I want to ask you about a little bit later on. Oh, okay. Um, because I, I don't know what it would mean to borrow or to merely borrow their strength. Well, uh, and yeah. for some reason, I forgot here what the other thing was that we got. So uh, we don't actually read the corruption room the cor until oh, yeah. the next loading screen. Yeah. Time for Alfred? Time for Alfred. And so, appropriately well. enough, that if you've sent Annalise here, so corruption, a secret symbol left by Carol, runesmith of Bergenworth. Several runes contain a nuance of blood, including the rune of corruption, associated with the oath of the corrupt. Pledgers to this oath are Cainhurst Vilebloods, hunters of blood who find dregs for their queen in cold blood, particularly in that of hunters. Yet the corrupt are heretics in the eyes of the church, and thus subject to the wrath of the executioners. So that last line kind of providing a hint as to the gameplay function of the, the yeah. oath runes uh, and the incompatibility of that, uh, you know, that setup of yeah. cooperation. Which is, again, uh, like, it looks like another cut content thing because it really should be like Hunter of Hunters or opposed to Blood Drunk Hunters. Yeah, but it's yeah. Like, like, it looks like it should have been, uneven. like, It's yeah. uneven. It's uneven. Yeah. It's like it's missing it's pieces. It's just this weird, like... If you're a hunter of hunters, there's like a five percent chance or something that when you're summoned, you're just randomly hostile, which makes no sense at all. Yeah, because it's uh, like, and, and, uh, yeah. Sorry, go on. They were kind of redundant covenants in the original Dark Souls, so the idea but they of, they, had, they had PVE purposes at least. Yeah, but it's like okay, you, you pair it down to three, it's like a good start, but mm -hmm. then the three here don't really seem to work very well. So time to step up the insanity. Oh, good to see you safe. Now, let's think up something to discuss. Just tell me what piques your interest. In his time, Master Lagarius led his executioners into Canehurst Castle to cleanse it of the Vilebloods. But all did not go well, and Master Lagarius became a blessed anchor, guarding us from evil. Tragic. Tragic times, that Master Lagarius should be abandoned in the accursed domain of the Vilebloods. I must free him, so that he may be properly honored in martyrdom. Aha! 
Is that the sigil of Kanehurst? I've heard tell of Kanehurst nobles and their amusingly pompous invitations. Wonderful. I thank you profusely. I will depart immediately, but first, a token of my gratitude. Ah, I feel my master's hand at work. Praise the good blood. And let us cleanse these tarnished streets. Wheel Hunter Badge. Martyr Logarius led a band of executioners, and this badge was crafted at their dedicated workshop. The wheel symbolizes righteous destiny. Their workshop was a secretive enclave of mystical beliefs and heady fanaticism, you can say that again, which <laughs> served as the backbone of the Executioner's unique brand of justice. Yeah, and again, the Executioners have their own workshop. They have a dead, it's not the Healing Church workshop. And it's not... Which is, again, yeah. another, a thing, something that would have been really nice if, if we had actually gotten to... Yeah. Uh, if we were able to visit that in the DLC. Look, I've done it. I've done it. I'm smashed. You're jealous, aren't you? Pathetic! As you deserve! The blood! You spilled my blood! Pray for Master Legarius in my stead. Radiance, a secret symbol left by Carol, runesmith of Bergenworth. The rune for Radiance adopted by the sworn executioners under Logarius's command. The executioners despise the impure vile bloods, and no matter what the circumstances would never cooperate with the bloodthirsty hunters who serve the undead queen, Annalise. So again, hinting at the gameplay incompatibility yeah, between those yeah. two oath runes, but also, uh, you know, uh, suggesting some interesting lore things. Yeah. Or not really suggesting, reinforcing, because at this point, uh, yeah. Look, I've done it. I've done it. I've smashed and pounded and grounded this rotten siren into fleshy pink pulp. There, you filthy monstrosity. What good's your immortality now? Try stirring up trouble in this sorry state. All mangled and twisted with every inside on the outside for all the world to see. <laughs> oh. oh, you, is it? Look at this. Thanks to you, I've done it. Well, isn't it wonderful? Now Master can be canonized as a true martyr. <laughs> I've done it. I have. <laughs> I've done it. I have. <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> queenly flesh, um, and we've taken quite a dark turn with yeah. Alfred that JSF and I really were just talking nowhere. about, <laughs> that without any additional context of the story of the rest of the game, seems just like senseless violence against women, but the description for this reads, what remains of Annalise, blood queen of Canehurst, this pinkish lump of flesh remains warm as if cursed. 
All Hail the Undying Queen of Blood. And so this item, you know, kind of serving as a key to another hint about cut or repurposed content. Yeah, because we'll what's see. about to happen with the Altar of Despair makes absolutely no sense. And and as you'll see, like, the, the way that the screen sort of fades and then pops back into existence yeah. suggests that there By was the a cutscene that was supposed to take place. <laughs> yeah. And so something interesting that uh, I, I uh, meant to point out the previous time we warped here is that uh, if you've sent Annalise here, Ariana, if you've sent Ariana here, then you're you're f and you want to see Alfred's questline through to its completion, then you're forced to kind of come face to face with the dress that she's wearing and to make that connection. Yeah. So that's a really really uh, smart piece of game design. I never actually really noticed. And uh, yeah, th this whole part. Like, I suppose it makes sense because, you know, he's, he's, he's a fanatic. Complete, yeah, he's completed his, his, like, his life's, he's reached his apotheosis. It's all downhill from here. That he, he yeah. wanted to, much like Logarius, become a martyr for the executioners. Yeah. and you can say he's got a little, like, I, I talk in the, in the Erden video about, like, shrines and altars. Mm -hmm. and you can see here he's put the crown of illusions on a little altar to Logarius, or the executioners in general. Oh, I didn't even look at that. Yeah. I didn't even notice that. Well, yeah, yeah. This is I like. I thought this might be the um the crown that I talked about in the trailers that's cut out, but that appears to yeah. be indoors. Whereas this is this is out. Unless, unless like this whole altar thing was originally in a building and they've copied and pasted it out here. My dog. I was distracted by this stupid dog who was trying to get me through the wall here. But but we still have the crown of illusions. So how would he have placed it there? I don't know. <laughs> this is why I think stuff was cut out. Yeah, because the what whole this shows. thing... The game's got a fucking execution of corpse model in it. I mean, they yeah, use it yep, in Yep, that they could have used, but they did not. <laughs> What's going on? This is like, like a Sierra adventure game puzzle. Stick the dead vampire on the dead moldy spider. Which brings the vampire back to life. Like the the pie in in King's Quest Five, you can use it for any number of things, but you're actually supposed to uh, you're supposed to actually save save the pie to throw at a yeti, yeah, a yeti later in the game, yeah. And later on, we'll sense. have to like pull some hair off a werewolf to make a fake mustache. <laughs> Time flows in reverse for this scrap of flesh. Yep, not shown. So for that <laughs> scrap of flesh. And really, for instance, I was, I was expressing my disdain for <laughs> the cut content there. Because, yeah, the, the way the screen fades, you know, I was thinking, oh, wait, did I somehow miss a cutscene here or something? And no. I'm like, oh, no, now I remember. It just no. flashes right back. Now, when we return, we find that... Yeah, and, and something I wanted to look at and, and compare was whether or not these these bloodstains here are from when Alfred killed her or if they were there previously. I, think I don't believe previously. that they were there previously. Are they? Oh, they I were. Don't I don't know. I'd have to go back and look. Arrant fool. Vile blood or no, forget not. We are thy queen. Bend the knee. Closest of kin, bearer of our blood, I welcome thee. What is thy wish? We await thy return for the honor of Kanehurst. So yeah, everything, everything is normal for her. Yeah, uh, she she doesn't seem to have noticed anything yep, is happening. There happened. are no consequences. Okay, so before we warped away, um, you asked if uh, I wanted to talk about Annalise's masks. So yes. uh, the answer is yes. So okay. what is the deal with Annalise's mask? No one knows what the deal with Annalise's mask is. Um, she says that she's prisoner to the mask, so it doesn't look like it's hers. It looks like 
kind of the Kane Hurst set mask, but it isn't. It's slightly different. And it's got a blindfold around it. In the same way that the uh, the Spectre ghost noble ladies have blindfolds. So it looks like they, for some reason they, the mask couldn't get off her or something, and they tried decapitating her in the same way. And we find the mask on the floor when, yeah. when we find the queenly yeah. flesh. And it's that back it's just sort of laying there. But that, you know, obviously she, she can't take it off herself, otherwise she, yeah. she would have it. Yeah, because she's prisoner to it. And, but that also has the effect, unfortunately, of ensuring that we never actually get to see what she yeah, looks like. Yeah, and people have, like, said, like, can we remove the fa- can we remove the mask and look at the face underneath? And it's like, no, I'm pretty sure... Like, the same thing's true of Eileen. And pretty much every piece of headgear that covers your entire face, it just replaces your head on the model. It doesn't go over it. So there's no oh. way to, like, glitch through her mask and see what she looks like. That reminds me of uh, when Halo, the first Halo game, first came out for the PC... Yeah. Uh, the end of the game, uh, he removes his mask and the, the camera sort of pans away uh, yeah. out of the spacecraft that he's in so that, you know, the, his face is obscured precisely at the moment when he actually removes his mask. And then when uh, the the PC version was released, uh, they found that when you reposition the camera, you find that he takes the mask off, and he, he takes his helmet head. off, and there's another helmet underneath. Oh, so... Cool. Uh, and I imagine as well that uh, because it's similar to the situation with the half transformed celestial in Yosefka's clinic, where you know you could access that game previously with a glitch, but yeah. if the developers never intended for you to see it, then it really, it, like I suppose it could mean something, but it like it in all likelihood doesn't mean it means nothing because they wouldn't have. You know, designed the game to reflect that any sort of difference. No, but uh, she, if you were... she might. There might be a model of Annalise in the game files without the mask on, but it would be a separate head model, is the thing. Because like in, in Dark Souls, like you can clip through the helmets and see people's faces, but it's there are videos showing like this is what Sigmaia looks like, this is what Silla looks like, because the camera's going through it. The helmets in Bloodborne appear to function differently, where they don't go over a character's head; they actually replace the head. So there's. If you like, you can clip through Eileen's mask, and there's nothing underneath because she has like that. That effectively is her head. But we saw, we saw. Uh, I guess the, there are exceptions, like with Defector Antel. No, but that that's different because that doesn't cover your whole face. Touche. Yeah. yeah. If it so doesn't, it's not, it's if not it obscured. covers your entire face, it just replaces your head, basically. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that that would seem to make sense. But I suspect that if we could remove it, and if if there is a model in the game, that it would look something like Lady Maria. I think, yeah, it would either look like Lady Marie or possibly um, look like Yarnum. Or like, yeah, yeah. Or or, or some midpoint between the two, perhaps. Because she's really, really pale. So I'm I'm kind of assuming okay, maybe underneath that she looks like a Thumerian, and that's why she's got the mask on. And so speaking of Lady Maria, who is, of course, connected to the doll, something that's very interesting that you raised in your Bloodborne Up Close on Castle Kanehurst is that when you reach your hand out or sorry when you reach your you reach two hands out to offer blood dregs to Annalise uh, yeah. it's basically the it's inverse the animation. Yeah, it's, it's of, an inverse of the animation that when the doll you, when you're leveling up by offering blood echoes to the doll and like yeah that was made before the DLC and we now know that the doll's based on Maria who was a distant relative of Annalise so that's very interesting. I don't know. Yeah. Do, you, can, do you have any idea what that might mean, if anything, other than just kind of an interesting... Well, Maria does appear to be able to channel blood. So it could be that, like, maybe the doll was designed in her image partially to replicate that. Although it's confusing because the doll in the waking world won't do that. You have to be in the in the hunter's dream for the doll to be able to channel blood echoes. But with mm. this relationship between blood dregs and blood echoes... That there seems to be some sort of mechanical relation, relationship there because blood drakes come from hunters who are blood fiends, people echo who, fiends, who, echo fiends. Yeah. One so, of the things I talk about in the Canehurst video is that echo fiend is a really weird piece of terminology, and the way it's it's written in Japanese is it's written like you would talk about someone who had a drug addiction. So it's like you're an echo, and I think the way they've written echo fiend. It is meant to make you think of like a dope fiend or a coke fiend or someone who's like mm-hmm. really yeah, but it doesn't or, or really perhaps come just a sort of an alternative way of articulating something like blood drunk hunter. Yeah, um, because because of course uh, as with the uh, you know as we discussed earlier this distinction or uh, between 
the maggots and the uh, centipedes. Yeah. That it seems almost like, yeah, these are, these are things that they, they repurposed in the game as a way of covering up cut content. Yeah. But then when, when they came out with the DLC, it, you know, it, it created kind of this disconnect between the repurposed cut content and the... the uh, recreated yeah, or reborn cut content and I like guess. for any for anyone listening who thinks that we're just like randomly papering over holes the souls games have so much cut and repurposed content in them that like this this is in no way like an outlier it's it's it seems to be and i, I have discussed this in uh i believe it was in my dark souls casual playthrough that it seems almost to be part and parcel of from's creative process yeah they they that, change during development, and that it's it's a very fluid development process. But also yeah. that, and this is something that I can relate to in my own creative endeavors, whether professional or otherwise, is that you know you often have these really lofty, aspirational visions of the things you want to do, and then when you know you are faced with the realities of actually bringing those things uh, to life, you. you decide okay yeah. maybe i need to scale this down but it doesn't a little always bit. even need to be like an aspirational ambition thing it can just be well that didn't work out the way we wanted it to yeah, yeah. or, or uh, this yeah. is just way more of a pain in the ass to program yeah. than we like, thought like, it might be like for a quick example like the centipede demon boss in dark souls that was originally the boss of undead parish where you fight the um gargoyles and like the boss was finished and they tried it and they just decided it doesn't work that well and they moved it to demon ruins which is itself kind of a cut and paste yeah yeah uh, like an example of the consequences yeah. i guess of uh, not ha- of of the the realities of game development clashing sort of with the initial vision i guess yeah but like you see the opposite now with like projects that get crowdfunded and they they're in development for like 6 years because mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. no there's no like investors breathing down their necks saying where's our ROI or something like that or or the likes of uh, Duke Nukem Forever yeah exactly yeah that's the thing or Daikatana which in in the case of Duke Nukem Forever was it is was actually something like four or five different games yeah like uh, getting way off topic here but like when people <laughs> talk about um like y- Yui Tanimura is the reason Dark Souls Two was kind of disappointing for them. That's completely untrue. What happened was, that game was, was like, going totally off the rails, and no one really knew what they were, like, trying to accomplish with it, and Yui Tanimura was brought on during development to get it back on track in, like, half the time they had left, mm-hmm. to just make something out of what was left out of the original design of that game. So the fact that Dark Souls 2, like, the worst you can say about it is bits of it were kind of disappointing. It's a testament it's to how remarkable. good Yui Tanimura is, because yeah. this, it could easily have turned into, like, Duke Nukem Forever or Sonic 2006 or something. <laughs> yeah. Without, like, him basically just showing like showing up and, like, we have to fix this now, here's what we're going to do. It and, could like, have been a complete and utter disaster, and that it is, wound and that up... That is another really good example of cut content, because, like, if you've ever wondered why Dark Souls 2's world doesn't make physical sense, it's because those places didn't originally connect to each other in the way that they do in the game. And so when we cut, uh, talk about cut content, I, yeah. I, I suppose it also bears mentioning that, you know, in this episode, we did mention a few instances in which it, the cut content was disappointing. But cut yeah. content isn't always a bad thing, and it's not always, uh, it, it, it doesn't always imply that things were, say, held back for. It, that's yeah, true in it many can just cases. Be a purely creative That things are held back they, for yeah. DLC. Re- or, the, to, or they just tried it and it didn't work. So, mm-hmm. okay, we'll just cut it out. So, so bringing things back to yeah. uh, Blood Dregs, uh, I just pulled up the item description uh, once again, and it says that, because uh, I, I was questioning the, the mechanical relationship between yeah. Blood Dregs and Blood Echoes, it says that they often appear in the blood of yeah. Echo Fiends. What Blood Dregs are, this, going back to Japanese, um, Blood Dregs are basically, it just means corrupted blood. And the impression I get is you look at the blood of hunters and there's like, you're, you're drawing the corruption out of that blood. And giving it to mm-hmm. Annalise. You're like trying to get the purified corruption out of it for Annalise to conceive. And uh, to conceive very specifically the, the child, child of blood. blood. So, which like, may uh, also be the thing that Ariana and Yana are conceiving. Which is something that, uh, even though we didn't really get a chance to touch on yeah. it all that much in this episode, that I, I would highly recommend everyone, once again, if you haven't already seen it, uh, to drop everything, including this video right now, and go <laughs> and watch JSF's video on Odin. Because... Uh, even though, you know, in ultimately in your conclusion, I, I don't recall if you actually said this, but like I felt at the end of it, 
okay, well, I guess we really don't know all that much yeah. about Odin even still. But with that said, we don't know that much in a way that is more satisfying to me, if that I, makes yeah, any sense. Yeah, basically just trying to clear the air because there's so many fucking theories about Odin. But, are you uh, sh- or, like, are you sure Odin's that the doll's not Odin? I'm not. Oh, you are. You you <laughs> may be surprised to learn this, but some people do think Odin Odin has a, a lot of. Oh God, I mean, because Odin is is formless. Therefore, anything you don't understand in the game, you can just plug Odin in and say it's Odin. And I was just trying yeah. to say that no, Odin's yep. actually quite a simple concept. His influence, uh, based on the things that you discussed in that video, seems to be more localized than around Odin Chapel than has has previously yeah. been suggested in virtually every yeah, Odin exactly. theory there is. Yeah, and, um, like, one of the... Going back to the whole child of blood thing, you get the impression, okay, Odin is trying to conceive a child out of blood. He needs corrupt blood to do that, and corrupt blood is what you're giving to Annalise. So that raises the question of whether Odin is the father of Annalise's child, and possibly Yarnan's child. And that's come up a lot, and the answer is, like, the problem is we don't know how many great ones there are. So it's very hard to tell, like, if it's just limited to the great ones that we find in the game. You could make a very good case. That are explicitly case. referenced. Yeah. You could make a very good case for Erden being the father of Annalise's child and of Murgo. But for all we know, there's a bunch of other great ones that... And, and there's not a lot of yeah. evidence of Erden's influence outside of Odin, uh, the, the area immediately, con- you know, surrounding yeah. Odin, Odin Chapel, Chapel and the tomb of Odin. Because, as you pointed out, it would seem almost... I, I really like the idea that... Uh, you presented where Imposter Yosefka, uh, because, you know, when you think about it just on the surface level, uh, her connection to Odin Ch- Chapel does seem, you know, it doesn't seem to make any sense because, we, of course, only yeah. we only encounter her in the one place in, in, uh, in Yosefka's clinic. But it would seem as though perhaps based on that note that we touched on very early in the series that we find in the, uh, what is that room called? I just call it the weird study. The weird study in between the tomb of Odin and Odin Chapel proper, uh, where we find that note that is written by someone who seems to know a heck of a lot. And so yeah. I, I like the, the, the uh, you know, however tenuous the idea that you presented that, you know, perhaps you'll, you'll, uh, Imposter Yosefka heard us coming and then just kind of quickly got out of there. Yeah, and went to the clinic. Uh, and went to the clinic. And, and that's, the again, reference... that's, that's the trigger for her taking over the clinic is us going to Odin Chapel. That's as good a theory for, uh, like, charting the movements of Impasio of Sefka as yeah. I've ever heard. So Yeah, she starts uh, off in Upper Cathedral Ward, goes to her study. Then when we show up, because the uh, the elevator to Upper Cathedral Ward's blocked, she runs off to the clinic. Which, yeah, makes makes a lot... And, and really, uh, so again, even though uh, this video doesn't contain a, a whole lot of really mind-blowing revelations, there are... It's, it's almost like a good version, uh, and I say this in the best possible way, like Death by a Thousand Cuts, where it, by the end of it, you're, you you feel a little bit more secure in not knowing things about Odin, whereas previously it was just so Odin overwhelming, the, the constellation Odin, of theories the out there character. and ideas. Yeah, Odin which... Is, Odin is all blood in the world. Odin, Odin is, is blank, etc. Yeah, it's like Mad yeah. Lips. <laughs> Odin is blank. <laughs> Pretty much. That brings us next... Oh, and I, I guess I should mention that um, Dezo Penguin made a very interesting post on the Bloodborne subreddit titled it In Defense of oh, yeah, Yosefka, yeah. which is something that uh, I wanted to talk about, but given the sheer number of comments we have in this episode, I'm going to hold off on discussing yeah. no, I've, that. I've got it bookmarked, but I haven't got around to reading the whole thing yet. Because it's not just a, a Reddit post itself. Like He actually links to a Google yeah. Doc, which uh, I think it's something like 15 pages when yeah. I downloaded it. So uh, I, I will provide a link to that in the video description below, and it's quite interesting and yeah. uh, raises a lot of really good points that you know we did not, we have not yet discussed in the context of this playthrough, and and touches on the points of, that others have made in the way that I've come to expect from Dezo Penguin, given yeah. uh, his recent participation in the series. So yeah, he, he comments on my stuff as well. So, yeah, I, I wanted to point out, Dezo Penguin, if you're watching, uh, although I'm sure you are, uh, that, that uh, I noticed your post and I really liked it and that we will be discussing it uh, ASAP. Um, moving on to... Oh, can I bring up one more thing about the mask? Oh, Sorry. Yeah, go on. Um, Annalise's mask, it looks kind of like a crow, like it's got a beak to it. And this is a thing that I've only just kind of figured out. This kind of explains the bloody crow. 
because there's, there's a lot of crow imagery around Kanehurst. You have Annalise has the crow mask. You have the bloody crow of Kanehurst, and then Kanehurst is connected physically to oh. Hemwick, where the eye collector is. And her thing that she uses to scoop out your eyes is stylized after a crow's beak. And Hemwick Holy is the shit. area that's full of crow. So it looks like there's like a crow motif running through that, which possibly links with Eileen as the hunter of hunters because she worships a crow, but I'm not sure. And sky burial and all that. So yeah. <laughs> Really adding more questions, and, but and in a way that once again is very we'll satisfying. To, but that's that's very because because I've I've never been really satisfied with anything that I've read about the bloody crow of Kanehurst. So <laughs> why why and who and what and where and how and yeah. uh, like it just so totally confusing. So uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. As for Logarius, you mentioned that Logarius seems to have mummified himself, and that's and, how I took it. Yeah. Well, because you get these references to him sitting serenely on the throne, and there's references to, like, poetry and stuff. Um, his, like, little thing about we must always strive to be good. So it doesn't seem like when we think of martyrdom that he died in a very violent way. To me, it's because Buddhist uh, monks would, would mummify themselves sometimes to, like, as a way of achieving enlightenment. So it just struck me like that, like he's, he's mummified himself uh, as a way of sort of keeping Annalise at bay rather than him, like, having actually died. And also, I guess, kind of in stark contrast to the, and I don't know, I keep coming back to this, but in stark contrast to the kind of the, the poetic nature of that, that like, uh, you know, the the image that's painted in my mind of kind of the the, the yellow snow pooling underneath yeah. his chair well, all his bodily is fluids are just draining out of him. That yeah, he sat there and just kind of died a slow and painful death. But then, and maybe it's just something that we're supposed to take for granted, but maybe it has something to do with, uh, I guess, the next thing we'll talk about with yeah. Locarius but is like, that... Th this is why I bring up, like, Japanese stuff. It's it's only partially because I'm a pathetic weeaboo neckbeard. It's also <laughs> because, like, there's a bunch of stuff that, that is taken for granted in, in Japanese video games and in Japanese culture that when you transport it across that doesn't cannot quite go work. without explanation, yeah. And that goes both ways, localized. by the way, which is, like, you look at Dark Souls 2, there's a lance in that. Now... Japanese uh, mounted horse combat did not use lances. So when you get lances in Japanese games, very often the assumption is that you would ride with a lance on a horse, jump off the horse holding the lance and stab someone with it. Oh, yeah. And that's how the Grand Lance works in Dark Souls too, because it's, it's basically a gigantic spear that you hold with two hands and you stab people with it. Which is yeah, yeah, works. which yeah. doesn't yeah doesn't really make all yeah. that much and sense. Like, that's true in, in Berserk, the um, Miyazaki's favorite manga. That's very, like, European-influenced aesthetically, but it, it's the same kind of thing where you have people in, in very, very well-referenced European armor in, like, European-style battlefields, but they're talking and acting like they're samurai. So they'll be saying, like, the guy will hop off his horse and it's like, this is the the, the wave-cutting technique passed down through my family for eight generations and stuff, which is, the, like, medieval knights did not do that. But that's that's how you imagine a samurai doing it, so the character's behave like samurai but equally that's that's i think at least for me what has always been so intriguing about the souls games is yeah. is yeah th this weird and uh really unique mashup of east and west mm. uh that it's you know a western sort of story being told from an eastern perspective yeah. and and yeah and that's why even though uh like we were discussing with with redgrave that you know, you and I disagree about things. You and Redgrave disagree about things. Disagree about uh, <laughs> so all three of us kind of come from come to the lore from these different perspectives, yeah. uh, and you know, privilege different sources. But but equally, that you know that the disagreements that the three of us kind of have with each other really does reflect the disconcordant nature of. A game that is made by Eastern developers in a Western setting. Yeah, and also like the fact that we all disagree with each other, you can find like that that's just different perspectives, and we're all not necessarily right and wrong. It's just about we've come at it from different ways. Which is once again what what I think is not only uniquely valuable about the Souls games and like analyzing the lore, but also what you know that the gaps in the story. It it actually takes more work to create gaps in a way that yeah allows for that space for interpretation than it does in, an, in you know, other games where 
they sort of tack it on as a last. So again, and I, I apologize to anyone who still plays Destiny and that the fact that I keep harping <laughs> on it, but but the 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 idea that and and the connection, the similarities that were drawn in the aftermath of Destiny's release of oh well, don't worry, it's just like Dark Souls. That's how the story's like in Dark Souls. No, it, like to to craft a story in this way that allows for so many different and valid interpretations mm. takes way more work in my view than it does to simply, you know, it's not a method you can use to save time or to completely scrap and redo a story in six months before a game's release. Yeah. It really goes down. It, it comes back to the, the philosophy that Miyazaki's, that we've talked about at several points throughout this playthrough, that, yeah, he wants everyone to have that space for interpretation. Yeah. The way I, I have explained it to Redgrave and, like, to other people is, like, it's like the, the story of the blind man and the elephant, where there's the three blind men, and they're trying to describe an elephant by feeling it, and they all feel a different part of its body, so they describe it differently. And the point is, none of them were actually wrong, it's just that they needed to communicate. Which is why I like that, like, we guessed on each other's stuff, and we, like, comment on each other's stuff, because it's this constant, I found this, oh, I found this thing, oh, I found this other thing, and it's all kind of coming together. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Which is why, and, and, you know, I I don't want to slag off any, anyone else who makes content for the Souls games, because I think it's all valuable, but... In, in certain corners, there's this this conception of doing lore in these games that is basically, okay, you do the lore, you make four or five different videos, and then you move on to the next game. Or, yeah. or you, you just wait for, you know, channels that are normally devoted to Souls games that just kind of go dormant after mm. their first few video, you know, after they've done or, several videos. Or even, videos. like, the video style where it's just, here's what I think happened, and mm-hmm. then it's over in five minutes. And that's why, mm-hmm. like, the re- I know I go on forever, and I'm very long-winded in what I do. I'm, wor- I'm worse. The I'm point worse. is, I, I am showing <laughs> like the process that led me there so you can tell that this is not like I was on the bus the other day and thought it might be Erden and had this great revelation yeah yeah yep. so it's like I, this and this and this and this and if you dis- you can disagree with any of those points but hopefully like I have brought to light something and, and, you, I've, uh, I've, yeah. and vice versa as well, that, that you inspire others to kind of challenge you and, and force yeah, you to come yeah. to clearer articulations yeah, like, of yeah, your Because this stuff. is not like an idea I had. This is like I have actually, I've collated all the data and I'm looking at it. I'm trying to figure out what the explanation <laughs> is. Yeah, yeah. Like a very positivist conception of, yeah. you know, understanding how the world works. But yeah. returning to Logarius. Yeah. Something that that we were discussing during the boss fight was, yeah, this idea that Logarius is perhaps a Tumerian. So yeah. what do you think about that? Well, it's something that originally I didn't agree with because I thought people were just saying he's Tumerian because he's tall. And a lot of the characters in, in Bloodborne are quite tall. So I don't think their tall was a very good explanation. But what sold me on it was he uses basically the same AI and the same uh, kind of weapon that the Tumerian elder and Tumerian descendant use, and like in addition even, to you know, in addition to having Soulbrand in his other hand, yeah, but that's the <laughs> thing. Like his his <laughs> little um his little pick axe thing that ch- the the blade of that will change in the same way that like the Tumerian elder has the like flame weapon that changes shape as you're fighting with it mm-hmm, into so, like a morning star and, yeah, and, and he's, like he's an got axe and... like he's got the silver hair and everything and this this kind of ties into like we were talking about the the way the Tumerians are described as being like they were servitors basically to the great ones and then what happened was as the great ones were sleeping presumably they they transcended and went to the dreamlands the tumerians without anyone to sort of rule them they declared that they had a queen and they became like a hierarchical society with a queen and elders and descendants and stuff and yarnum is the current queen so that and um you'll notice Kanehurst, which is descended from the tumerians that also has a queen it's also very hierarchical and they don't seem to venerate the great ones so it seems to, like, I had this conversation with Redgrave, and like I don't want to I don't want to put words in his mouth because this is just something we were discussing <laughs> idly. But it almost seemed like maybe there was a kind of like Tumerian civil war, and that the, and the, the, the monarchist so that would make the Kanehurst kind of, people yeah. sort of like a splinter group of Which the Tumerians. Which explains why there is all of that armor in the chalices because we never see any enemies in the chalices wear it. So if that mm-hmm. was the armor that like the the kind of royalist royalist monarchical whatever faction of the Thumerians wore it would explain and they were forced onto the surface that explains why there's all these bodies in the chalices that have that armor but none of the enemies do because the the kind of the Thumerians that we fight in the chalices purged all those they up and left or or they were purged yeah they were purged so their bodies are still there and the rest of them went to the surface and that might explain Ligarius because he's obsessed with hunting down Annalise so if he was like the leader of the opposite faction oh he could have been brilliant. led to the surface I've got to get we have to stop 
Annalise. That is brilliant, and and formed the executioners. As, formed the you know, executioners uh, to get rid of the Thumerians who'd moved to the surface. Very interesting. So Logarius would seem in in that, uh, you know, following that train of thought, would seem to be uh, a very important figure in terms of the the early church. That uh, yeah. although he's not really discussed, because uh, the the executioners garb reminds us, and and the rest of the set that. Uh, the, the executioners, basis. it served as the basis for all later church attire. You want to know something else, like, odd? What's that? The impression I get is that Yarnum, the city, not the queen, is itself an old Thimerian city. Because that would explain why you've got a, you've got a, a chapel that's dedicated to Erdin. Right. It's a great one. No one knows about them. In the city, it's called Yarnum. Now, the city's not named after Yarnum the queen. Yarnum is a Thimerian word. If you look at the Thumeru Ihil Root Chalice, it says that Yarnum's not her name that she was born, but she takes that name when she becomes queen. So it's it's, so it's ex- almost like like Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, it, or, or like when when a pope is is named or a pope. Yeah, yeah. yeah they they assume a so name. So Yarnum is a, an important word in Thumerian, and that the city is called Yarnum, and no one there outside of the church knows what a, a Thumerian is. And, and there's old messenger Yarnum, gargoyles. You, you pointed out earlier yeah. as well. There are messenger is... gargoyles. The kind messenger of, gar- there are gargoyles that look like messengers, and you find them everywhere. And you like no one in Yarnum. Do they know what messengers are? No. Uh, well, no. well, uh, there, there are statues to the messengers, though. Yeah, exactly. There's all this like stuff that looks like it belongs in the Chalice Dungeons. Yeah, all over. Yeah, and Altar of Despair. There's a hmm. lift in Yarnum that goes all the way down to somewhere that looks like it's part of the Chalice Dungeons, or a part of the old underground labyrinth. Well, if, the same thing, whatever. If. <laughs> Old Underground uh, the, Labyrinth, Chalice Dungeons, Catacombs is the same place. I, I separate the Chalice Dungeons uh, Why? as a matter of, well, as as a Dreamland's reflection of the Old Underground Labyrinth. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Point is, it looks like, like and I, I think I've talked about this before, but clearly the time span of the Healing Church, Yarnum wasn't built by them. Mm-hmm, Even the mm-hmm. cathedral probably it, it, wasn't built by them. They just moved into this place that already existed and set up. It's almost impossible for them and to it's have done. Got, like, this is another thing that I noticed in the old Hunters, when you go to the Hunter's Nightmare. Those amygdala statues at the cathedral, they're there in all the different versions of it. They're there in the past. Because mm-hmm. I was expecting when I saw that cathedral, I'll go there and there won't be amygdala statues on the side because they were moved in later on. But it looks like, no, they were actually there to start with. Which would be consistent with a civilization that venerates great ones, Yeah, exactly. Right? It looks like this, that and Canehurst were both like... This city was built at least on the foundations of a Thumerian settlement, which is very, very interesting. Yeah, and and uh, again, the, this way of of looking at it, the, this way that you framed it, would seem to have placed Kanehurst in the story in a way that uh, that is more consistent with the rest of the story than you know any other yeah. way of framing it that I've and come it, across. It makes me wonder, far. honestly, um, did the do the Thumerians hang around the labyrinth? Because that's where they come from, or have they been forced underground? Or do they originally live on the surface? Because if they originally lived on the surface in places like Canehurst and Yarnum, and they were forced underground, you can see there would be there would be this this faction led by Annalise that want to go back onto the surface and control it. Because the Great Ones and are the, all asleep at this point. And also that just you know they they don't really have a great life. No. <laughs> in like when when you come across them in the Chalice Dungeons, they're, yeah, they're as zombies. I pointed out in that one episode, like the the, the uh, where we were exploring the uh, Eyes Gravestone, mm. and and I'll, I'm going to address the how I've continued to pronounce that uh, in just yeah. a little bit. But it is East. It, it is East, but I'm going with Eyes yeah. just because. So there are three housekeeping points I want to get to before uh, we actually get to the comments themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first is on several uh, different videos and several different contexts. I've had people ask what platform I'm going to get uh, Dark. I'm going to be playing Dark Souls three on. Uh, and so I, I do intend to make a separate sort of channel update Dark Souls 3 plans video, but I should just point out here, because I've only pointed it out in the comment section of previous episodes, that uh, I'm going to be playing it on the PS4. Yeah, as um, will I. And then, so if you want to run into JSF and, uh, or myself, and uh, you have a choice between the PC and Xbone or PS4 versions, uh, you will only run into myself and JSF in on the PS4 version. So, second, this is another comment that I've gotten in several different contexts, and although this comment was very kindly answered by JSF, who uh, does a better job of responding to comments in my videos than I do, and I very, <laughs> so I very, I very much appreciate that, JSF. But Wisvane writes, "How did you get your character to level 250 at the normal new game cycle?" And so, once again, this isn't 
the only time this question has been asked, it's been asked several different times. And so what you're going to be seeing in the background here now is basically how I got my character to such a high level. And that is more or less not only farming for echoes, but farming mostly for uh, radial blood gems. And I know that there are better ways of doing this, but we did get our hands on the lower Loran Chalice very early in this playthrough. So I used that to my advantage mm. to farm the first layer of the lower Loran Chalice uh, over and over again, killing the Silver Beast boss because uh, it didn't take very long for me to to be able to kill that boss with just a single visceral attack with the appropriate rune setup. But killing that boss over and over again, I can do it in about a minute 15, a minute 20 seconds, as you'll be seeing in the background now. And at each each time you kill the boss, you get some, uh, I don't recall exactly how many souls, but something like 100,000 souls, which at lower levels gives you a lot of levels very yeah. fast, in addition to a chance to getting, uh, a chance at getting bloodstone chunks and decent radial blood gems. So, for all the people who keep asking how it is I got my character to this level, rest assured, uh, there's been no no funny business going on. In fact, I'll show on the screen right now how many hours, I think it's over 160 hours for the the build I've been using for this playthrough, the Aegon of Astora build. Uh, and a huge portion of that time was spent just farming the first layer of Lower Loran over and over and over again. Uh, to the point where I could do it pretty much only half paying attention that it just became muscle memory after a certain point can so, i ask a question about this build you sure can why are you doing this uh so <laughs> because surely once you hit about like maybe 100 110 you don't really need to level up anymore to the new game to be a cakewalk you don't but uh the obsessive compulsive tendencies that i have basically uh, it started as just being, yeah, just that. Like, get, get to 110, 120, something like that, and the rest of the game will be more or less a cakewalk. Because the original purpose for becoming overlevel was just so that I could talk about the lore without yeah. having to worry too much about the gameplay. But after I got to a certain point, it was like, okay, well, maybe I'll get it up to level 200. And yeah. then when I was looking at the stats spread, I was like, if I get it up to level 250, then I'll have 50 in everything, which also means that every single item or uh, you know a, a hunter's tool or weapon i pick up i can yeah. use it right away yeah and and so that's why like uh, in in the last four or five episodes anytime i've picked up an item so like in this one when i picked up the executioner's glove i used it right away just because yeah to show it off although yeah. you know i'm sure everyone's seen it but there are many people who haven't so i remember that, that uh, being an issue when we were going through the old hunters that like I was unlocking all these weapons that my characters all had, like, 10 strength and couldn't use. Yeah, the min-max builds. Yeah. And whereas in the previous Souls games, you could still see the moveset, yeah. or at least a bastardized version of the moveset, like in Dark Souls 1, where they, they swing it really, really slowly, but you could still get a sense of what the weapon looks like and how it feels. Yeah. Uh, in this one, you can't equip it at all if you don't meet the requirements. Yeah. So... So to answer your question, JSF, basically it started off as just, okay, I'll get to an acceptably high level to make it, you know, so that I don't have to struggle gameplay wise. Uh, but then it wound up just being, it would be really nice to have everything nice and even at 50. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> and so we're at level 250 now. I'm not leveling it up anymore just because everything is nice, nice and yep. even at 50 across the board, which means that, yeah, we can use anything that we pick up. The third thing I wanted to talk about before I got to the comments proper was uh, I received a comment from Random Guy, and I have had a couple of comments like this, so I, my, I'm, I'm not trying to single you out here specifically, Random Guy, but where he writes, I'm a fucking moron, so I deleted my comment on your Alter Despair video. I feel the need to repost it here as I spent a while writing it and it never received the attention I feel it may have deserved. Here we go. So while we are going to get to the rest of Random Guy's comment in a moment, I, I did want to pause on the first few words in this comment and and speak to that a little bit and recently you have all been ex expressed great pleasure at the fact that i've been uploading these videos faster than i had previously and i want to i, I want to point out and help everyone understand that it's not so much the work involved in putting these these videos together that is the hardest part easily the hardest part in putting these videos together and putting them out there is the the vulnerability that's involved that you're putting your ideas out there and you don't know whether or not people are going to laugh at them and think that they're silly and stupid and 
that extends in in the you know on on the other hand to my own sensitivity to that by knowing and and this gets worse each time the the comments tick upwards each time i release a new, new episode there's more comments than the previous one that there are so many comments that i i think are great and insightful and that you know speak to things that i personally could never speak to because of the, the unique experiences of the people who wrote them but that i just couldn't possibly get to them all and so when there is a large lapse in time between uploads on my channel yes in part it has to do with my workload in in my professional life and that's another thing too is that this isn't my full-time job this is something i do on the side in my spare time and, and i know for jsf it's the same yeah but that when you know i'm i'm faced with all of these these really great comments and, and i want to feature them all in large part because i don't want anyone to feel this way i don't want anyone to feel that just because i didn't read out their comments in the episode that it somehow means that their ideas aren't aren't insightful or that they themselves the last thing in the world i would want is for anyone to think that just because i and and what do i matter i'm only as good as the community that's around me that just because i didn't select and read out their comments in you know on a youtube video that that doesn't that doesn't make you less than anything um that that should not and and i understand it's easier said than done because as i mentioned the hardest part for me in making these videos and and i don't know if it's if you feel uh similarly jsf Mm -hmm. But the hardest part for me is, is once again, putting yourself out there. And, and I don't really conceal all that much when I'm making these videos. Um, so when... So when... <laughs> I, j I so when just put it out there. And by the time I'm done, I'm like, I hate this. I just want it to be over with. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. put well, it and out there and then I'll just log out and do something else. And, and something that you mentioned, JSF, is that... Uh, but the the anxiety of wanting everyone wanting to not wanting to make anyone feel as though oh, totally, yeah. their ideas don't matter that that is the reason why you reply to every single comment on your videos yeah but and and i i think that that's amazing i have this idea of jsf as being just what is essentially a superhero sitting there, uh, you know, spending an entire day responding to comments well, on his channel. Well, the thing is, though, like I have slightly less than 3,000 subscribers which is a fraction of what you have and it's a total mm -hmm. like it's less than 1% of what someone like Varty has mm -hmm. so it's like I can reply to all the comments I get because I only get you know a video will generate maybe maybe like 20 starting off and then it'll maybe hit like 100 by the end of its lifespan and that's mm -hmm. doable I can answer that but like when people say like oh you need more subscribers you need to grow your channel it's like if I grew my channel and I had 300,000 subscribers, I would not be able to read this. It would not be physically possible. And I value being able to, like, I get comments that say things that I want to be able to respond. There was a, a discussion recently about, like, um, Catholicism. But when I bring up, like, the religion in Bloodborne, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of Catholic, but it's mostly Shinto. And we were having this discussion about, like, venerating the, the body parts of saints and stuff. Like, that wouldn't be possible at all, because I would never see that if I had mm -hmm. 100 times the subscribers I do. So, that's the advantage of having a small channel. And I feel the same tension uh, as because I think recently I uh, this channel went over seven thousand subscribers yeah, or you've something. You've got a shade over seven thousand. I've got a shade under three thousand. And so uh, you know, with each episode, so the the last two episodes of Bloodborne, Let's Talk Lore, or the last three or four, something like that, uh, there was one that was under a hundred, but for the most part, they they exceed a hundred. And yeah. and that's it, it, just the unfortunate reality of it is that I can't get to all of them. Uh, and even though you get fewer comments on your videos, JSF, I, I feel that even if I had a commensurate level of mm. comments to be able to respond to, that I'm really bad at writing things addressed to people in a reasonable yeah. amount of time. And so oh, I've yeah, had a yeah. few, pe I've had a few people uh, ask me for feedback on videos that they've done, uh, and I've responded in turn by recording my stream of consciousness thoughts and just sending it to them that way yeah. and that's that's because it, it takes me so long it takes me a really long time to write yeah particularly and, like when you're on the internet you have to be very careful how you phrase things because there's no tone of voice yeah yeah so I, I overuse emoticons like i am yeah. <laughs> like a 15 year old texting someone 
because I want I, I, everyone I, I, I to know. I overuse ex- like, exclamation points. I am not saying this in a sarcastic way, but the problem is if you use too many emoticons, it looks sarcastic. Yeah, and so, so, so I like I experience that tension, but like times a hundred, where every every single sentence I I think about the different ways in which it can be interpreted, and so it's just personally, and and this is a failing of mine, not of the people who leave comments, it's just personally not possible for me to respond to every comment, just as it's not possible for me to read all the comments on the show. So all of this is to say basically that if your comment is not read on the show, that please don't take it personally, please, Uh, because it's a big part of what makes it difficult for me to make these videos is making those decisions and not wanting anyone to feel that way. Uh, and second, that if you, if you really want to have your uh, your comments featured, um, I'll, I'll give you some brief insight into the things I look for. And so th- this isn't to say that if you hit all of these points on on the list that I will feature your comment 100% for sure. Because, uh, for example, the, the comments of Desil Penguin in the last few episodes, even though I've, I've featured in most of the episodes... Uh, I, I'm not reading out one of his long comments in this one just because I've done it in the last few episodes and I, I try my best to get to people who haven't had their comments read previously. So this isn't a 100% criteria, but these are the things I look for in general. Uh, the first thing is that uh, if you think that by replying to a comment that I've written elsewhere with something unrelated that it's more, more likely to be noticed by me, it's actually less likely to be noticed by me because I read all the comments on the channel comment page which only displays the top level comments and the replies it displays the most recent ones yeah so if you if you yeah this is something happens to me too if you reply to a comment and that comment is like a couple of days old it doesn't show up on the comment page because it shows up under the original you get a little alert for it but if you have multiple alerts it's hard to keep track of them and they get lost i'm not saying that you shouldn't reply to comments not not at all but if the the purpose of your comment is to have it featured on the show then make sure it's a top level comment don't reply to someone else uh the second thing is readability so uh, try to ensure that your your ideas are organized as best as possible use line breaks if it's just a, a wall of text it's very difficult for me to read on the show and i know that a lot of people who watch this series uh are not people who speak english as their first language uh so i try to be mindful of that but do your best to be attentive if you if english is your first language of spelling and grammar uh and a tip that i think is more or less universally applicable is that if you've written something and you want to you want to really get a sense of how well it flows read it out loud to yourself because you're, when you're reading quietly, uh, your mind sort of fills in blanks where they exist, or, or you know, it's it's much harder to notice disruptions in your flow when you're just reading it to yourself. So read it out loud and ask yourself whether or not you could imagine me reading it on the show. And if the answer is no, then you might you know want to consider uh, trying to organize your thoughts a little bit better. So line breaks, point form, however you want to do it is is fine by me just as long as it's easy to read uh the third is tone and and that is uh, you know that you are sensitive and inclusive in your remarks so i had someone for example who wrote a very interesting comment that i would have loved to have read out but they they used a pejorative term for people uh you know who are deemed to have mental illnesses and it it just really soured me on the whole thing and as Many of you know, you know, if you've been here any longer than a few weeks, you know that inclusivity is very, very important to me. And uh, I try to ensure that this channel is a very safe place for everyone, uh, irrespective of who you are and what your background is. So try to be sensitive to that if you want your comment read on, read on the show. Uh, the fourth is redundancy. So if it's a topic that I may have covered uh, how you know directly or otherwise in a previous episode, then I'm not likely to bring it up again. Uh, so, on on the subject of Henrik as a pale blood hunter, uh, I felt that to some degree we had covered some of the things that that were discussed in this comment uh, in a previous in in one of the earlier episodes. But it has been a long time, so I may be wrong about that. And, and finally, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the last factor is more or less happenstance. So don't take it personally if I don't address your comments, because there are just way too many. One thing that I, I run into is people who, um, 
they watch the video and they basically leave comments in real time. So please wait till the end of the video because I, I will sometimes get like eight comments in a row from the same person and the later ones will say, oh, I see you address this later on, never mind. And it's like, it's, just, it's hard to know like what, what, cause I'll start replying to someone and then it'll turn out there's a more recent comment where they go back on what they said before and it's hard to kind of keep track of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, I've had that too. And so, yeah. yeah so that's, that's really cool. On to random guy's comment, which yeah. again, I I didn't mean to single out you specifically, random guy, because I do think this is an interesting comment, but I did want you to know that my having not read your comment in a previous episode is in no way should be uh, interpreted in no way as a reflection, uh, as a negative reflection of my thoughts on of you as a person. Random guy writes, I believe Henrik is a pale blood hunter. First, I'll outline my evidence. Henrik said, the taciturn old hunter Henrik was once partners with Father Gascoigne. And though they were a fierce and gallant duo, their partnership led to Henrik's tragically long life. Henrik's unique yellow garb is resistant to bolt and will be of great help to any hunter who has inherited the onus of the hunt. Young Yarnum girl, uh, so daughter Gascoigne, when she says, who, who are you? I don't know your voice, but I know that smell. Are you a hunter? And I love you almost as much as mom and dad and granddad. And in terms of the music box, a small music box received from a young Yarnum girl plays a song shared by her mother and father. Inside the lid is a small scrap of paper, perhaps an old message. Two names can be made out, however faintly, Viola and Gascoigne. Henrik was once partners with Gascoigne, and if popular theories are to be believed, was the granddad to which uh, daughter Gascoigne refers. Recall that pale blood hunters have queer moon sense, which, as we saw earlier, Annalise uh, noticed. Mm. And that a hunter in the girl's family would need to have this scent in order for her to distinguish it and associate it with hunters. I believe this moon-scented family was a family member was Henrik. I believe this because of multiple things. First, his set's description. Henrik lived a tragically long life because of his partnership with Gascoigne. And I initially took this to mean the duo was so proficient in their hunting that they were unstoppable, and thus tragically saw many horrible things. While this may be the case, it could also be taken to mean that Henrik's life was tragically long for other reasons. Those other reasons may well be the may very well be the immortality of pale blood hunters. The next part of his set corroborates this, saying that he wore a garb which was resistant to bolt. Recall that recall where we find bolt. We find it in Dark Beast and Silver Beast. Silver Beasts are found in the Nightmare Realm as well as the Chalice Dungeons, and Dark Beasts are found in the Waking World and the Chalice Dungeons. It's possible that Henrik's contact uh, contract involved clearing dungeons or traversing nightmares, which falls in line with the idea of pale blood hunters. Not to mention, of course, the last bit of the sentence, which uses the words inherited the onus of the hunt. Most normal hunts don't involve silver beasts and dark beasts, so the description has to be referring to the pale blood hunts. Next, the music box. The box appears to be a present from Henrik, as it has a message within which is apparently addressed to him, or addressed to them. Take take from that whatever you wish, but it's obvious to me that Henrik crafted a music box, box which plays Murgle's lullaby and gifted it to Viola and Gascoigne. Well, actually, this is interesting, because when I saw, because um, uh, Aegon sends me, like, the comments that we're going to read out, and I saw this and I thought, oh, I, I know this guy, I've answered this before. And then I checked, and no, I, I got pretty much verbatim the same theory um, on my Erden video, but from a completely different person called Negative Claim. So I have no idea if they're the same person or what. But um, anyway, I think it's actually pretty likely that Henrik was a pale blood hunter because he has the air rune, which mm-hmm. is all about the, the echoing will of the people who came before you. And this will talk about the onus of the hunt and stuff. So I think, yeah, it, it, and that's left out of both um, both theories that I read is that Henrik drops the air rune. And the air rune, when it says the echoing... No, it was, it was, mentioned, it was mentioned by oh, okay. Randall. It wasn't mentioned in, in the version I got. But yeah, okay, to yeah. me, the air rune is the big giveaway. Uh, but also, also the fact that in in light of uh, patch one point oh seven, that we can summon Henrik yeah, he's using the the old yeah. So I, I don't know if all Confederates uh, well, actually. I don't think that all Confederates are pale blood hunters, but it does make it more likely, in my view. Do you want my completely like messed up head canon theory about Henrik? Right. This is we're gonna. This is something I brought up on Aegon's last video, and he's not in the comments because I'm already here, so it's redundant. But okay. <laughs> Thing you need to understand about Yahargul. Yahargul in Japanese is not the unseen village, it's a street. Yahargul is a street in Old Yarnum that Mensis have had bricked up, right? To conduct their experiments in. If you, you can, you look at Yahargul, there is a, a perfect, it's not a straight line, it's a winding road. Leading from the chapel where Mikolash's corpse is all the way to the very end where we find the Tonetris on a corpse and the wall there, that's not a wall, that's an archway that's been bricked up. 
Right. So Yahagul is a street in Old Yarnum that has been bricked up for Mensis's benefit. This is where I get completely stupid. Um, <laughs> it, it, oh, it gets worse. Gascoigne's music box, right, plays Lullaby for Murgo. Lullaby for Murgo is a song that Mensis know because it's the song, because they, they're the ones with Murgo. And the wet nurse mm-hmm. reacts to Lullaby for Murgo. So Gascoigne and Henrik are partners, right? Henrik's garb is resistant to bolt. What the what this comment doesn't mention is that the other place you find a bunch of bolt stuff is Yahagul. All the bolt stuff in Yahagul, which is something I mentioned on your last video, suggests to me that that's where Archibald's workshop was when it talks mm-hmm. about the spark hunters. So it seems to me, like in my head, that what happened was Henrik and Gascoigne were a partnership. They worked for Mensis, and they were involved basically in the scourging of... Basically, the bricking up of Yahagul, forcing out the Spark Hunters. And that's why Henrik's stuff is resistant to Bolt, because you would have to fight a bunch of people with Tonitrises. Hmm. And there's a dark... Very piece. interesting. Yeah. So, and, like, yeah. And that would explain why Gascoigne's got Lullaby for Murgo on his box, because he's worked with Mensis. And also the, the, the... Yeah, drawing attention very, very uh, aptly to the... Like, what purpose would there be for a garb to be Bolt resistant? Yeah. Were it not for if he were siege laying siege to the spark hunters, if he was and if he was just fighting normal, normal yeah. beasts, like uh, there'd be no need to have a bolt resistant garb. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's very very interesting and certainly uh, a distinct possibility that uh, there's more to Henrik than we've previously discussed on this series. So thank you, random guy, for um, bringing that to our attention. So the next comment is from Vanderhoven. Take it away, GSF. Uh, on the topic of the note, the Mensa's ritual must be stopped lest we all become beasts. I didn't really understand how the Mensa's ritual could turn people into beasts until you gave the reskin scourge beasts a look. I never really gave these enemies a thought before I wrote them off. Maybe part of maybe in part of them being reskins, or maybe because like yourself, I'd always ran through the area. We can assume that the Mensa's ritual is responsible for the fleshy scourge beast, considering you don't see them anywhere else. So perhaps the message isn't referring to transforming into beasts in the traditional sense. Depending on the time frame of when these beasts appeared, this could be why some of the petrified people are cowering in fear, uh, as I couldn't really imagine anything being more terrifying than your friends and loved ones being amalgamated together into disgusting beasts. So what do you think? Well, I think it's it's more complicated than that, because there is a note in... Old Yarnum that says um, the Red Moon hangs low and beasts rule the streets. So, it, and also the Red Moon descending is what triggers Gilbert to transform. So it seems like when the Red Moon is there, like obviously beasthood predates the Red Moon, but it seems like the Red Moon is like a catalyst or something for beasthood, or like the um, the sort it makes bodies more malleable for transformation. Um, the other interesting thing, you know, there's the three Yahagul hunters in the chapel. Mm-hmm. The middle hunter, the one who's standing on the grating, he the one he's got the beast claws. He drops claw mark, right? And he's got no he's got no clothing on apart from the Yahagul helmet. So it seems to me like he is he is in the midst of transforming into a beast. Is the impression I get? At, at least in the pre DLC, uh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It really gives the impression <laughs> because that he's, there, there was no he's beast almost room. a beast at this point because he's got the claws and he's taking his clothing off and he's dropping claw mark. Right. Also, where he's standing. This is getting really convoluted. He's standing on that grating. On that grating, you know, there's a corpse, right? Mm-hmm. That corpse drops the moon rune. Mm-hmm. So it's like that spot there seems to be a locus for the moon, and that might be why he's transformed. Interesting. Other thing which I, I brought up is Yaha Gul's full of mirrors. Which I've never seen mm-hmm. anyone else ever talk about. You know, those those big wooden screens you see around Yaha Gul. Many of them are draped over. Like, yeah, they're it, mirrors, yeah. and they're either they have like doors on them. They're either closed or they have a thing draped over them. There is one mirror that is in the Hypogean jail, uh, in the room where Adela is, that is uncovered, and in front of that there is a corpse with frenzied cold blood. So it looks like whatever he saw in that mirror caused him to die of frenzy. Interesting. Also, I'm almost done. They are the same <laughs> mirrors you see in the Nightmare of Mensis. And... Which Mikolash is yeah, uses Mikolash to... Yeah, Mikolash jumps through them. Mikolash has two of these mirrors. It's the same texture, but it's lighter, and it's got this, like... If you look at it closely, it has a sort of distortion effect, like a sine wave applied to it. So it's sort of, like, rippling like water. He's able to jump through those. And I'm just like, the mirrors are clearly important, and I, I've had all kinds of like ideas that I've run by people, and no one's really sure. 
Like, I, I thought maybe the mirrors might be reflecting the moonlight around Yahogul, if the moon was See, important. See, I, I always just interpreted them as, as being more or less uh, analogous to, like, the, the statues in Kanehurst. As we discussed earlier, where it's just like, eh, no, but maybe it it's just a video really, gamey it thing. It seems really deliberate, because, like, you, there's um that room in uh, Yahagul where there's a brick troll, a bell maiden, and, like, a guy in a chair with a gun. Right. Mm-hmm. I know that's not very descriptive. Um, where, where we find the, the upper cathedral ward. No, no, it's another one. It's the one where, like, you run and the first thing you see is a brick After troll the running around the After the first staircase. Yes. That has, one of the cells has three mirrors along the side and a gap. And then right in the middle of that room is the fourth mirror. So it's clearly, like, it's deliberately been moved from that cell. So I don't think the mirrors are, like, a random thing. They they clearly seem to be important to something. I just don't know what it is. Central in some sort of Mensis secondary or, or tertiary Mensis ritual. I think, they're, oh, no, I think they're part of the ritual. Or, or part of the ritual. Interesting. And I can't think of what they would do other than reflect moonlight. And it's also, in as in the, the previous episode, it's also, at least to me, unclear as to whether the... Um, collective scourge beast the 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 body part scourge beast whether they were you know amalgamated into the scourge that type of scourge beast as a result of the mensis ritual Mm. or whether that was something that the tumerian bell ringing women came in and and are that they might be responsible for them i think it's the bell women um yeah there's another i I tend to another point here is that we're calling them scourge beasts it could just as easily be this is just meant to be a smaller version of the one reborn, and to save time, they've just shoved this, they've just reskinned a Scourge Beast model. Yeah, yeah, well, and they did that in in the uh, the research hall with yeah. w- several of the, the patients uh, are effectively Scourge Beasts. Yeah, it, it's the, the, the patient ones that body climb with around the Scourge on all Beast fours, right? AI and animations rigged. Yeah. Through. Yeah. So this looks like we needed an amalgamation of corpses, so they just changed, like, the skin of a Scourge Beast and made it a new enemy. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> which it would seem to make sense, uh, and, like, given everything else we discussed in this episode. like, you find them in the cells, like, around where the dead Snatches are, so it's like the, the body parts in the Snatches bags came to life or something? I don't know. All right, well, uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, but yeah, I'm not really sure in general still yeah, what to think of make those. Any sense at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the next comment is from Koi Pop, who writes that I think that as the Mensis ritual beckons the moon close into the atmosphere, apparently, it's the moon's proximity that causes the scourge to manifest in the blood. Blood ministration may have been relatively benign before the church in Mensis began to attract the moon presence, which may explain why the ritual and thus the hunt traditionally take place at night. I think there were many Mensis rituals in the past, each leaving another beast outbreak in its wake. And as they managed to beckon the moon closer and closer, the beast grew larger and larger until the night of, night of our hunt when the ritual finally bore fruit. The one was reborn. And I think that the one reborn is, is an allusion to Frankenstein's monster, an amalgam of cadaver parts assembled to create a new man, or in the school's case, a new god. It is the school's attempt to ascend the populace, their reborn after death, as a great one. So I, I think that this is a really interesting and well put comment yeah. but uh, as I expressed in the previous episode I do think that the one reborn is uh, the product of the bell ring yeah, I, I think that as well their machinations as opposed to the Mensis ritual what itself, it looks like which... happened is Mensis's ritual basically briefly fused Yahogul and the nightmare together it, like it broke down the barriers so Mikalash and his friends were able to escape into the nightmare but it left like a hole, and out of that come the bell maidens. And they're like, oh, this place is full of body parts, I like those. Yep. And they just start doing their thing, and they create the one reborn and the cramped caskets and the the um, body part scourge beasts. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's uh, that's the, the, the ch- uh, sequence of events I attempted yeah. to articulate in the yeah. previous episode. Like, by the time we get to the one reborn, Mensis are gone. They're all mummified. And we even see the... the end point of whatever ritual the the um bell maidens are performing when we enter the boss room yeah that we see them opening up this portal yeah. either through or in front of the the blood moon so the next comment i i was wanted you to read this comment because i was hoping that you would speak to its contents he calls upon cause herself to use the lightning attack this is uh, the orphan of cause and then Deso penguin replies also, the fishmen mages use lightning attacks as well. I think there's a direct parallel there as the worshippers of Cos, like the orphan, call upon Cos's power to summon a lightning bolt. So what I wanted to ask to Random Guy, to Desil Penguin, and also to you, JSF, mm-hmm. is did I miss something in terms of 
the the certainty with which this idea is being bandied uh, about. I that... I was not. It never occurred to me that they were summoning the power of Cos. It just struck me as yeah. a lightning attack. Just just because yeah, I I had never actually seen that idea proposed. I just thought it was a thematic thing because it's a, it's a raining overcast village, so it's like there's a storm going on. See, I could see the fishmen mages using lightning attacks that are drawn from somewhere else because of the huge. Well, if you look at what they do, they they hold the, it's like you can, they hold it up as like a lightning rod, and that makes lightning come out of the sky. It's not like they're generating lightning from within themselves, like the silver beasts do. So that makes sense. Um, the the orphan of Kos, uh, the lightning attack that he uses, is specifically referred to as the bolts of sorrow in the official yeah. guide. It's a bit pretentious. Um, so it's a bit pretentious, but it does suggest that the attacks are, you know, the sorrow is that of the orphan and not something that's being summoned from Kos. So I don't know, maybe there's well, there's some, there was some big revelation that I missed it, on Bloodborne true, subreddit I'm or something. I'm not sure that the rain stops when we beat Kos, we beat the orphan of Kos. I can't even I'm not remember. sure, but if, if, if the rain does The sky stop, clears up. If the sky clears up and the rain stops, it does seem like it's linked with the orphan because it's like the orphan is causing this this thunderstorm and he's able to summon down the lightning from the thunder from from the clouds. Mm-hmm. So it's like linked with him. So I guess it's not necessarily I don't know. Yeah, I was just confused confused at at this idea because I'd never actually seen a proposal I've before. And here either. was here was a random guy and Desil Penguin talking about it. It like as though it was common knowledge. So so if anyone wants to well, so to fill me in on upon cause if she's dead. Yeah, well, she's a great one. Oh. I don't, I don't know if, <laughs> but yeah, we're we're getting into yeah. very muddy philosophical territory here, so let's move on. But thank you, random guy and Dezel Penguin, either way, for raising the possibility. And the next comment is from Matu Freak, uh, who points out that I S Z in Japanese is transliterated as Isu. Uh, Isu, uh, no I, sadly. And Dezel Penguin pointed out in reply. He he, every time I post a comment which says, hey, we should check the Japanese sources for pronunciation tips, I find that somebody else has already done the actual work to find out. Thumbs up. For those who don't know, the Japanese I vowel is pronounced much like a long E in English. So uh, several several people have very kindly and and, help, and, and helpfully pointed this out, that uh, I, it, it's not a home run in the same way that, or in fact, that it's not supported by the Japanese, uh, the original Japanese text. My change in pronunciation for the ISZ chalice in the same way that it was for the Tumuru chalice. Mm. But I'm just going to call it the I's chalice because I think it sounds awesome and it's easier for me to pronounce. So I hope you all forgive me and understand that when I'm pronouncing it that way, I'm not doing so uh, in a way that, yeah, is authoritative and yes, this is how it's properly pronounced. It's just how I want to pronounce it. Uh, the next comment is from Ed Soros one I don't think that the One Reborn is an attempt to recreate the Orphan of Kos, but to recreate Kos herself. The Great One that came from the water is Kos. The Orphan was just in her womb. We know that the Thumerians had a lot to do with blood and rituals to bring people back from the dead and immortality, and that the School of Mensis was studying these kinds of rituals. What if they abducted bell-ringing women to cast the magic and use them to create the One Reborn? Um... So, like we kind of already covered this about like, although the separation of the two events. Yeah, although but... the thing is, like he's got there, they may have um, uh, what is it? They um abducted bell ringing women to cast the magic, and it's like the thing is, there's already Sumerians working for Mensis, the Snatchers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so they mm-hmm. do appear to have some kind. Of, I I I to kind of about this, and I call, I called them subcontractors. Okay. <laughs> they've got them, and they've got like the that. um the eye collecting woman, right? Mm-hmm. Who's like a descendant of the witch of he- not not literal descendant, but she's like a version of the witch of Hemwick. And mm-hmm. the witch of Hemwick seems, and like the impression I get from the witch of Hemwick is that she's like, in the same way Annalise is like a degraded version of Yarnum, the queen. The witch of Hemwick is like a degraded version of those the the, the witches in the chalices who threw the fireballs. Oh at yes, yep. Because she's like yep. the same sort of hunched over like witch design. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they could be Thumerian, for all we know. Or at least, like, half Thumerian. Mm-hmm. So, I get so, the impression uh, Mensis, like, are working with some Thumerians, but maybe not the... Basically, the issue I have is that the bell ringers aren't there normally. Mm-hmm. But I guess in, in, in the context... Like, I just thought this was an interesting comment, and I included it, because I think that it raises the possibility. It's not one that I'm, yeah. I'm particularly uh, convinced by, but the possibility that maybe that 
uh, sort of alliance extended yeah. to, you know, that the, the bell ringing women, uh, or, you know, however the, the, the Tumerian, yeah. uh, society is structured that they struck a deal whereby the snatchers, you know, would, would help them collect body parts. The yeah. same thing with the and eye like collectors. The, the healing and then in exchange, yeah. they, they could have the leftover body parts after the Mensis nightmare had been beckoned. But also like the healing church, their servants, clearly they're Thumerian. As mm-hmm. are the, the church giants. So it's like, it's not clear whether, cause they never display any intelligence, really. So it's not clear mm-hmm. whether like they're working for them. Or if they're able to just, like, they're just somehow able to exert influence over Like, they, they just dig them out of the labyrinth and they just do what they're told. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. But the thing is, like, bell maidens... What triggers a bell maiden to appear mechanically is that you ring a bell and you, you call out across worlds. Mm-hmm. So it seems like the Mentis ritual was just a massive version of that. And it summoned, like, eight bell maidens. Although we don't find any bells, kind of, in, in the... the architecture no but the the, the the principle not the bell but the, the mechanical yes, principle yeah, like they yep. called out across yep. the worlds and mm-hmm. it summoned a bunch of bell maidens it's just like that's what's happened but th- which i see as an unintended consequence yeah. of that ritual yeah. but but i do i did want to grant the possibility yeah. that you know maybe it was uh you know a deal brokered i guess yeah. between the two sides yeah. uh just because i think it's interesting although i i'm i'm more inclined to see it as more of an incidental yeah. unintended consequence well i think everything that- everything we find in Yahogul after the blood moon descends is an unintended consequence the the one re- people focus on the name the one reborn as if it's meant to be a specific person being resurrected but um if you look like i've brought this up a couple of times but japanese isn't always like with plurals it, it can sometimes like it doesn't have to specify whether a noun is singular or a plural so i think really that boss should just be called the resurrected ones and just because it's like a big tower of corpses like the rotten is or nito and it's just the bell yeah, and, and there's yeah. there's precedent for that type of boss and yeah. and a boss with that type of background in the previous yeah, I don't think it's an so attempt it's... to resurrect anyone in particular. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I concur. But I, I did think it was an interesting possibility. Yeah. Uh, the next comment uh, is from Jude Myers, who very kindly pointed out that the Beast Hunter actually dropped the Clawmark rune, and in the previous episode, I uh, picked it up in the midst of the battle, yeah. and then, and ac- you know... Actually, who uh, else right. drops the cl- is Does Gilbert drop the Clawmark rune? Gilbert does drop the Yeah, Clawmark so it's the same yes. prince. Like, that guy's turning into a beast. Gilbert's and they both drop Clawmark. And so just to read the description, since I read the wrong description in the aftermath of having killed that uh, hunter in the previous episode, uh, the claw mark is an impulse to seek the warmth of blood like a beast. It strengthens visceral attacks, one of the darker hunter techniques. Although the difference is subtle, Runesmith Carroll describes the beast as a horrific and unwelcome instinct deep within the hearts of men, while claw mark is an alluring invitation to accept this very nature. So I basically read the opposite yeah. of the item description that I ought to have after killing that hunter. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. Um, the next comment is from Scott Fremen. I wonder if Mensis ritual in the note simply means a ritual being carried out by Mensis, not its specific title. Presumably Lawrence had once used a ritual to beckon the moon presence, leading uh, through some sort of vague causality to the beast plague. The writer of this message seems to have been conjecturing based on his previous knowledge of what similar rituals have been done in Yana. Mensis is shadowy, so their true operations and end goals were likely not known to the people captured in Yahagul. Perhaps the original Japanese note would shed some light. So that's uh, that, that last sentence or that last yeah. question is something that we'll, we'll probably have to look yeah, into later I, on. But... Gonna have, I, I've looked at it, and I don't think it, it says anything that's really that different. But I'll, I'll get someone, I'll get a native speaker to look over it. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, thank you to all, all those of you who not only help in the comment sections of these videos, but also those who help JSF with his uh, translations because they've been, yeah, essential in helping us kind of put together the story in this playthrough. And uh, But I did want to, yeah, I, I liked the, the point that Scott raises here about uh, the Mensis ritual just sort of being... Uh, that it's it's not a title or, or a way of referring to the ritual that is meant to be taken necessarily literally, yeah. but that it's just... Whatever Mensis yeah, is doing. Uh, whatever Mensis is doing. Yeah, because so, they could have done this before in old Yarnum. Mm-hmm. Or it could have been someone else entirely. Yeah. So the next comment is from Max Cat, who wrote, Could it be that the Chalice Dungeons were, or maybe even still are, flooded? And... 
this is something that Deadly Doodles, a possibility that Deadly Doodles raised in the in a different context, and that is uh, he, he or she writing that I think that Yahargal may have been flooded. The positioning of the bodies as well as their poses seem to indicate that they oh, were yeah. madly trying yeah. to climb the buildings to a degree where some people are even on top of others. They're trying to climb over others. This would also serve to explain why there are no bodies on the open streets. Some people even look as if they were slammed against the wall, something that uh, is most notable at 5711 in the previous episode. Uh, that The som somewhat haphazard positioning of the cars also supports this theory. The only question now is what foul substance flooded Yhargul? So I, I, I l really like both ideas and, and, and it, the chalice dungeons being flooded at some point or another is something that I've been thinking about in light mm. of the 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 crate one corpse. What is it? Yeah, the, the sea the, monster corpse thing. Yeah, the, the sea monster whale. corpse, the pilot whale yeah. that was basically seems to have been modeled uh, as a direct replica yeah, of an actual uh, or directly pilot after corpse. that pilot whale corpse photo that uh, you sent yeah. me uh, some time ago, and uh, yeah. It, at least for parts of the the chalice dungeons that it would make more sense for it to have been flooded especially yeah. if we're looking at the chalice dungeons the, the, the really deep uh, the depths of the chalice yeah. dungeons as being the home of a great one like Koss. Hmm. well i was I, I had this this talk with redgrave and um he was saying like i was we were talking to him about um about urden being possibly the father of murgo and he's like how do you square that with um Erden seemingly being localized around Erden Chapel. Are you saying there's other Erden Chapels? And it's like, the thing is, the Chalice Dungeons that we go to, that's just the Thumerian Crypt. It's possible there is a whole, like, buried city under there that we just don't see, because all we're interested in going to is the crypt where all the bodies and the ritual materials are. So it's possible, like, there is this whole, like, flooded area that we just never visit. Yeah, and, that, and that's the thing, is that, uh, you know, it's possible that the reason why we're visiting that one and and the work of actually exploring the old underground labyrinth had more to do with somehow pumping the water out of there yeah. than it did like actually actually exploring well, possibly it. And, just but that, that raised the gooey substance that you find the poisonous stuff in um that cavern under forbidden woods yeah yeah or yeah yep yeah. but it raises a whole series of other questions yeah. that we unfortunately don't have time yeah. to get into today um just a thing about the flooding of yahagul the, the thing about those people that are clambering over each other is if you look at the walls, the walls themselves are actually kind of distorted. So it, it, the impression I get, right, is, you know, when you go to, like, the Hunter's Nightmare and it's Erden Chapel, but there's this weird, like, rock with all these striations in it growing out of everything. Right. The impression I get is that that kind of half happened here. Because you have, like, you've talked about, like, there's there's um, vines over the walls and stuff, which is true. But if you look at where the corpses are, they're, like, half... Some of them are half inside of walls. Like, some of the walls themselves look like they're melting. So the impression I get is all these people were frantically trying to escape from Yahagul. And there was, like, maybe a couple of seconds or even a split second where Yahagul and some area of the Dreamlands overlapped. And everything, like squished into each other for a second and just got frozen. That's the impression I get. The the idea that this um, possibility raised for me is thinking about the you know, cosmos-esque portal out of which the One Reborn falls. Yeah. That perhaps at some point, um, for, for what reason and, and uh, you know, at whose hands I, I cannot say, mm. but the, the vague idea I have in my head is of a portal like that opening up and just a deluge of water. Flowing yeah, out of yeah, it. that's possible, or even blood. But the, but then that also raises the, or even blood. But then that even raises the question: of Where did the water go? So sort of yeah, like that, a yeah, Noah's Ark it's, it's type si situation. But yeah, I, I think that the clue is really that the walls have been distorted, and there are people who are half in a wall, like the back halves in the wall, or the front halves reaching out of the wall, and they're all petrified, and they're all made of rock, and like the wall itself seems to be melting into rock. So it's just like everything got fused together for a split yeah. second. Yeah. But as as we've already established, your Hargle doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense no. anyway. So, the most but again, I did want... an interview with Miyazaki where he says he was going to make it clearer and decided not to. Which uh, implies it does make Miyazaki. sense, but we're never going to figure out what it means. <laughs> yeah. Well, certainly not in this episode. But the next comment is from Centimeter Worm. 
The fur on the cramped caskets I always thought looked more like the tattered remains of clothing, probably from the original bodies that were put in the casket. When the bodies become animated from the Mensa's ritual, my guess is that the flesh was twisted and fused, the clothing was torn, and probably got stuck in the cracks. Whatever fabric is left now hangs off the caskets in eerie shards. The idea is gruesome in and of itself, but I find that it reinforces just how quickly the bodies being thrown into carts and carried off, without even time given to undress them or give them their last rites. Feels more and more evocative of Black Death motifs. As for the vines wrapped around the bodies, it's a theory I've not heard before. I've always had the impression that whatever horror took place in Yarkul, it took place very recently. The idea that there may have been rituals for a period of possibly decades, with the School of Mensis trying more and more outlandish rites in their pursuit of ascension, is fascinating and opens up the timeline as for the school's creation and length of its existence a whole lot more. <laughs> as if we needed the timeline opened up oh, more than it already is. Um, but I, I did think it was very interesting uh, because, yeah, in the previous episode, I raised the possibility that the, the black things hanging off of the cramped caskets may may in fact be beast fur but uh yeah. after i recorded yeah, that, that episode sense. i also went what he said and and i looked at the the official guide and uh wanted to double check to see whether or not they were weak to the the beast damage type and in fact they are not yeah. and they also so they I drop think, beast hunter gemstones i don't know what that means well it, at the very least the the what centimeter worm has raised here this pot the, seems much more likely than what I was suggesting yeah, in the previous episode. And adding to that the the fact that they're not liable to uh, take extra damage from the serrated damage type, mm. uh, yeah, more or less negates what I said in the previous episode. <laughs> and then we have a comment from Prelis who writes, What really struck me about the One Reborn's intro cutscene being summoned from what is without a doubt the cosmos is that unlike literally every other cosmos effect in the game, it is discolored. Instead of the bright blues of your typical cosmos, this is a deep red and dark purplish effect. Could this be the abyssal cosmos in action? This might explain the intense rivalry between Mensis and the choir, or perhaps a significant aspect of it. We know so little of the abyssal cosmos beyond that the uh, beyond uh, what Ludwig showed us that the Holy Moonlight Sword channels the abyssal cosmos. But contradicting this, it's a cosmos. Uh, its cosmos is a shade of green. I don't know if, if it's a really good point. Though. Um, and I'm wondering if the the distinctiveness of that portal uh, is perhaps owed more to the fact that I, be, prior to the boss fight, I said everyone focus on the cutscene, <laughs> and then I and then I even slowed down that part. So maybe uh, uh, because when I looked at it, I, I noticed that it did look distinct as well. But I don't know if it's that distinct. But like to me, it just you know when the bell maidens normally they ring the bell and the monsters come up out of the floor. It just looks like that, but upside down to me. That they're just, like, ringing the bell and it's falling out of the sky. Because the cosmos effects you see, they tend to have, like, visible stars and, like, nova and things in them. Like, they look like, you know, like something from a science fiction game. Whereas the One Reborn thing, it just sort of looks like a red and black kind of weird effect. So I don't know if but it's actually that, the cosmos. But I think that could be more, more uh, indicative of the type of ritual, the, yeah. the type of opening up of the cosmos that's taking yeah. place, than necessarily it being a different or you know a different subset of the well, cosmos see, also the, the, we don't know if like abyssal cosmos is actually they mean that in the sense that there is a separate abyssal cosmos it could just be this is the do you want to know something really annoying about the english translation it uses the word cosmos constantly to just mean basically anything like this is it's a real problem the whole thing about ibriatus daughter of the cosmos and like oh does that mean it's this just the daughter of cos like no the the problem is that like the english translation will just sub in the word cosmos at random for any word meaning like um star planet sky universe anything like that so for example ibriatus is not ibriatus daughter of the cosmos she's ibriatus daughter of the stars and they change stars to cosmos it's like okay fine i get why you did that however this now means because we have this great one called cosm there's this confusion over, does that mean she's the daughter of Cosm? And it's just like, a very this general is why I look at the, at the translation the stuff. Because like, it, it, like the other episode you were talking about, the way Ibritas is referred to, using the same terminology that the, um, the Fair Maiden, Why Do You Weep uses. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's something that is nothing to do with like the translation's bad or anything. It's just not something, if you were just given that chunk of text you wouldn't necessarily know they were referring to the same thing. It's it's, so it's not that the yeah. translation is bad, it's just that's the reality of localization. No, it's not even that, that that's the problem. The problem is that Miyazaki is 
telling a story, very, very specific pieces of terminology mean very, very specific things. And if mm-hmm. you don't immediately grasp that, you use different words for the same word or the same word for different words, and it gets very confusing. And as we discussed earlier, uh, when, you know, a game is is taken from one very specific, it's specific cultural moorings and, and yeah. localized for another, that there there's a lot of hidden text between the lines yeah. that... You know, things that are just assumed yeah. um, on the creator's behalf uh, for, for good reason, mm. uh, based on the culture in which they grew up and live, uh, that, yeah, those things, it's it's a really difficult task to put on a localization yeah, exactly. team. Or, or not a difficult, an impossible one to say, you know, I want you to translate this and retain all of the meaning. Yeah. Eventually, we're going to run into Mikolash, host of the nightmare, which has led to all this show that, oh, is the night- he's, he's hosting it like it's in his head. And it's like, no. They've just used a word that also means host, but actually means like, like master and lord and stuff. And it's just oh, just like Manus, uh, Father of the Manus Abyss, right? Jesus yeah. <sighs> <laughs> and finally, we have um, a comment from Malcolm X, and I can't pronounce this name, so I'm not going to try. Uh, that looks Nordic to me. Yeah, I could be wrong about that. Uh, but it reads. Hey, Aegon of a Strike, just came to a realization in tarot cards. The moon card represents the imagination, psychic development, and forces that try to create evil for the soul. It even usually has a dog, wolf, and crayfish on it as well, reminiscent of the beasts in the game. I mean, just look at the card and tell me it doesn't remind you of anything. Yep. Malcolm X goes on to say that the Hierophant is the one who grants permission to enter the mysteries, and he has a similar hat and staff to Willem. The High Priestess guarding the veil of the two pillars reminds me of Queen Yarnum. Mm-hmm. And as as Redgrave raised a quite a while ago, that yeah, we already know that the Hangman is uh, basically the Hunter's Mark. The the Emperor and Empress uh, is Kanehurst Queen, and uh, it says Logarius, but I think perhaps the King would be yeah. a better. We well, just kind of look like analog. It's got a beard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and Ligarius, in an odd kind of way, sort of assumed the role of the yeah, king. Yeah, and there's that whole theory the about king. was Ligarius actually the king of Canehurst? Which Redgrave very... Red, Redgrave perfectly debunked by just showing us the the throne and saying he couldn't fit in that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So... <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> the answer was yep, under our noses yep. the whole time. The hermit reminds me of the lantern carrying church hunters, uh, but not it roll... Uh, not its role, so never mind him. But here's the picture anyway, uh, reminiscent almost of the the church servants. These connections to tarot came to me as you were talking about the moon. P.S. The temperance card might be related to communion, as the cup does not mean to, uh, to contain water, but that which holds life. P.P.S. Do you think these connections make sense? Because the game seems to be boring a lot of esoteric concepts from all kinds of mythologies. So... Uh, let me first say that I don't know anything about tarot. And I know Redgrave knows a little bit about tarot, so uh, I'd be interested in hearing what he thinks about this. But uh, I guess just the general question at the end, the the post-postscript, uh, that I think sums it up pretty well, that the game seems to be ju- borrowing, yeah. uh, that Bloodborne is really, and this is something that you've talked about a fair bit, JSF, that it just it's kind of an amalgam of yeah. all of these different cultural influences. But the thing is, like a lot of these things we talk about as cultural influences, they're they're motifs that recur across like all sorts of different cultures independently of each other. So I'm wary of like like the moon card, you've got wolves and you've got wolves in the moon and the moon being like a feminine symbol and a symbol of like darkness and a symbol of sort of overwhelming people, right? That's that's pretty much like everywhere has that sort of like in, in Chinese you've got yin and yang and yin is feminine and yin is the moon. And then you've got like you know European belief here what the moon's connected. We've got this this um belief that the moon's connected with menstruation, which it isn't, but things like that where, where it's just it's it, it appears independently in all these different cultures. So saying that like it shows up on the tarot card and shows up in the game before the game is is like the the referent is the tarot card. Whereas thing actually the referent is just the idea and the tarot card is one like version of that. Yes, that Bloodborne, like the tarot cards, are is is a reference to a more general uh, a more general set of ideas. Yeah, that that one is not necessarily the template for the other, but they're both they both draw on you know a a larger, broader template. Yeah, like, that if, seems if you to find exist. any kind of spiritual tradition, 
it will be like women are the moon and are water. And that just happens because it's all just to do with, it, it basically just comes out of biology because women have a 28 day menstrual cycle. And it's, it's not the same as the moon cycle, but they they end up being linked. And like women's bodies, like there's pregnancy and they change a lot. So they're connected with sort of flowing things. This is something I have to write about. And they're connected with like things that flow and change, whereas male bodies don't change in the same way. So men are seen as very static and stuff like that. This is something that, that you brought up. It was either you or Theomeni in, in a past stream with like that, the idea of, of men being culture and women being nature. Yeah, that's, nature, that's I've that... literally just written that paper. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> there, there's so a must famous you, um, uh, essay called um, "Is Woman to Nature Is Man Is to Culture," which um, kind of lays out the anthropology of this. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I, I guess just just by way of an additional example is a, a really uh, mind blowing paper I read in uh, the early stages of my studies uh, called. The Egg and the Sperm by an anthropologist named Emily Martin, yeah. and uh, it conveys the extent to which biology as a science relies on culturally informed metaphors to describe, uh, you know, biological processes yeah, exactly. of conception, and that, and this is something that I've discussed in the comments of uh, several different videos on this channel that trying to convey the idea that science and technology don't actually. Uh, commune with uh, pun intended commune with nature directly oh, absolutely. that it's always filtered through culture that, that there can be no facts yeah. or knowledge that exists independent of culture and, and like um like we were talking like wolves for so long we've talked about them being there's an alpha male pack leader and that's the point where like people just know what an alpha male pack leader there's no such fucking thing as an alpha male pack leader there's an alpha <laughs> pair but because the the biologists and the anthropologists who were studying the wolves, and anthropologists not saying, but you know what I mean, the people who were studying the wolves had this ingrained idea that men led everything, that it was seen as well the packs clearly being led by the alpha male, when actually it's the alpha pair that lead the pack. And so these things are are taken for granted, yeah. and then and then they're they're reflected back it, yeah, from it's, it's into taken and for from as these a piece studies. Of common sense, so no one questions it. None of this is to say that science technology are useless no. and they don't. Uh, allow us to do great things. It's an epistemological that, framework. Yes. yes, and and it must be understood in its cultural context, which, uh, even though for a long time we liked to believe that science and technology transcended culture, it is very much a thing that was developed in culture and, and therefore bears... But even then, like, we, we didn't see science and technology as transcending culture until relatively recently in human history. It's only, like, the last maybe... 200, 250 ish years that we've had this like divide, are there's just science and then there's other things. Because like the, the first, like the, all the scientific stuff in the Renaissance, I, I'm obviously massively oversimplifying for timing reasons, but like a lot of the early scientific stuff that we, you know, this is the great science that overthrew, you know, superstitious belief was sponsored by the church because they saw it as this is, this is a project to look at, you know, the beauty and wonder of God's creation. Or, or to touch the face of God yeah. is how it was. Yeah, put. but but yeah. you get this idea that like basically everyone was superstitious, and then one day there was a big switch with reason written on it, and someone flicked it, and suddenly everyone became reasonable, and they're polar opposites. This is completely untrue. Yeah, and and like you pointed out, the the, the, the previous topic is something that that you write about. This this is the topic yeah. that I write about constantly, and that is of of placing science in its cultural context or, or rather resituating it in, in its cultural context because for so long we've had this idea of science as existing apart from culture but yeah, uh, yeah my field science technology yeah. studies is very much concerned with understand not undermining or or you know just ceaselessly or you know meaninglessly uh, rebelling against science but of trying to yeah. improve it by allow, enabling us to yeah. understand it in its actual yes, studying cultural the and social context, method as it is applied as opposed to uh, ideally conceived yeah. uh or we went three hours without going on a diversion of that sort so i'd say that that's pretty good especially compared to our, our previous recording yeah. but uh that's gonna do it for this episode thank you all very much for joining us and thank you jsf for joining me thank you for inviting me and we will see you in the next one bye bye <laughs>